another sprint gold medal. What about the last change? Jamaica are away. Jamaica are absolutely flying. Here comes Cherian again. It's going to be Kenya's day once more. Oh, it's huge. She's waiting. It is a world record. Great Britain in third. Brilliant from the British squad. Good afternoon. The German sun continues to beat down on this final afternoon of competition here at these World Championships. An event dominated by an extraordinary individual, a larger-than-life character whose performances really have resonated around the entire sporting world. Oh, baby, you let me be. You love me, take me back. Put a chain around my neck and lead me anywhere. Let me be. Oh, let him be. Oh, teddy bear. I don't want to be a tiger. This tiger spray too rough. Well, I think the athletes are getting a little bit irritated, Steve, by the behavior of the bear. I wish somebody would check that mascot up. I really do. Well, this has almost certainly been the first major championship ever to be dominated by a furry mascot. And I'm delighted to say that Berlino has found time in his hectic schedule to join us here in the studio. <laughs> um, before we go any further, uh, th thank you so much as well for being here. Uh, are you familiar of the incident involving Rod Hull and Emu and Michael Parkinson? <laughs> Sorry, what, why the long pause? Oh. Uh, I, anyway, Michael... Um, <laughs> This, by the way, that is a picture for your scrapbook. Oh, right, absolutely. Do you know that? How would you assess? How would you assess the Bears' performances over the last nine days? Um, <laughs> <laughs> the the Malayne Walker incident has to be my favorite of, of all. And, I mean, he's been great. He's been uh, just you know interacting with the fans, and uh, we haven't had so many people up here since he decided to come up here and join us in the studio. So. He, <laughs> I think the great thing, Colin, though, has, has been his consistency, don't you think? Oh, I mean, he's been the only person to stay anywhere near Usain Bolt. So I think for me, he's, uh, he should be congratulated again so close to Usain on so many occasions. Now, Ber Berlino, I, I, know you might have, I know you have trouble, Berlino, pay attention, uh, understanding English, and you might have trouble understanding a, a, a Geordie accent, but <laughs> one of our team is unhappy about some of your antics. He, he, he's, he's found them close to being unbearable. And Brendan Foster, t tell us exactly what it is that you're, you're not happy about. Oh, you're making this a very, very serious question, John. I mean, the point of the matter is we, Steve and I, we thought bears were shy, retiring animals. <laughs> but we've come here and we've found out that they're not quite that. English bears probably are. But, you know, Steve and I are going for a run in the woods tomorrow. So rather than being critical today... <laughs> We thought what we might say was uh, thanks for the hospitality, thanks for making us feel so welcome in Berlin. And next time you're in London, come to the BBC and visit us there because you've got lots of fans led by our editor, Carl Hicks. He's in room 653. <laughs> Just give him a ring when you get there. If you get out of the woods tomorrow, you're sure of a big surprise, Brendan, I'm telling you. Uh, and, uh, but, but Berlino, there is a serious thing, because you're spokesman, because you obviously you're part of the Bears Union, which means you're not, I gather, allowed to make any statements on your own behalf. But your spokesman has said that you would like to publicly apologise for the incident involving Malayne Walker, when you could possibly have crippled a major international athlete. Is that, is that true? This is this is this this is the moment. I mean, would you, uh, Berlino, would you like to talk us through? <laughs> Michael, what did you you enjoyed this? But at the same time, yeah, it started to look a little sketchy at this point. I was getting worried here. I thought he may drop her. <laughs> I mean, have you lost your bearings at that point? <laughs> 
Has anybody got any more bear jokes they want to make? Or, uh, no, uh, I think... No, they haven't. I think that's enough. He's just... The... He's, his microphone's just fallen off. Um, anyway, listen, thank you so much. And just show us... Oh, there's yes, your gold medal. medal. Just show us... But, you know, oi. Listen, listen, Michael, just grab his attention with it. Uh, can we see? Can we see your your number vest under there, please? No, just grab it up. Just, there we are. No, what they say? Animals and children. Is that what they say? There we are. Ich bin ein Bolt. So, anyway, and uh, for those of you actually, this is this is almost serious. We have had hundreds and hundreds of emails. We were saying, how do they get copies? Or what copies of? Do they get replicas of Berlino the Bear? And the answer is. They're sold out. They have not any. They have none left in the stadium. You cannot get them anywhere. So you know, eBay. It's the only way. This is the most valuable bear on earth, <laughs> and he gave us his time this afternoon, and we are all privileged to have been in his company. <laughs> I think. I think we go along with that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> right, that is that is the main event, but we do have one or two things on the undercard this afternoon as well. For example, Kenanisa Bikili of Ethiopia going for another world title, a double gold in Beijing and the world record holder, of course. He is to distance running what Bolt is to sprinting. And you saw Mo Farah in the picture behind him there. He'll doubtless accept that he'll struggle to catch Bikili this afternoon. But after that, anything's possible and a top five finish is well within his compass today. And hoping for more than that is Lisa Dabrisky. Her preparation for this hasn't been ideal, but a medal and maybe even a gold is not such an absurd thought today. Then there's the relays. Our women will bring in Christina Hurugu to try to repeat our medal achievements of Helsinki and Osaka. We've never finished better than third, though, in this event. Whereas the men have two gold, a silver and a bronze to their name over the years. Any colour today, though, would be a real bonus. And then there's Bolt. Not running today, just posing and posturing and smiling and generally being Bolt as he picks up another gold medal. So here is our programme from now until the end of these World Championships. We have the women's long jump and the men's javelin. That's always a fantastic event anyway, uh, starting things off. Then we have the men's 5,000 metre final with Mo Farah and Bakili. The women's 500 metre final is at four o'clock your time. 25 past four is the men's 800 final. That really is wide open as well. And then the two relays to round things off uh, with uh, the men's four by four as ever, bringing the curtain down at 5.15. So we're going to go back to last night, first of all, and we will talk about Bolt. Actually, uh, Bellino, do us your Bolt impression. Do your arrows for us. Will you do your... He's got a clue what I'm talking about, has he? Will you, will you do that? There we are. There he is. We, we are, Michael, come on, join oh. in. Here we are. All doing that. Hey, hey, hey. Um, because Bolt last night, <laughs> obviously, another gold medal, and perhaps more important than that, an absolute bravura performance after the race. Away they go, the men's 4 by 100 metre final, Jamaica in lane 7, a great start for them by Steve Mullings and Williamson has started well for Great Britain, first handover, here it goes, it's a good one, Britain's is a good one as well, Jamaica perhaps with a, sp a short lead here from Trinidad, there's the great man now, has he got the baton in his hand, he has and away he goes, Great Britain also going well, Marlon Devonish for Great Britain, Trinidad and Tobago trying to chase Jamaica, Powell has it, for them on the last one, and away he goes. Trinidad in second, Great Britain in third. Japan trying to get there. It's going to be Jamaica, then Trinidad, and then Great Britain. Here's the clock. 37.32, the winning time. Great run by the Jamaicans. Usain Bolt, surprisingly, not that dominant on the curve. A great curve by Marlon Devonish, but Asafa Powell put it all away for the Jamaicans here because the exchange, the third exchange, the Trinidad and Tobago team right on their inside. We're right there with them. I think the Jamaican team was affected a little bit by that poor qualifying time, that slow qualifying time that put them on the outside. But what about this British squad? Williamson to Edgar to Devonish to Aiken Zariti. That time, 38-02, the quickest they've run this year. And we said if they could produce their best here, they could win a medal. They did exactly that. Well done, guys. The seven gold medals. That's, that's just an incredible haul. Well, you know, Jamaica is really taking over you know, track and field, you know, and, um, you know, this is something that is going to continue for years to come. 
I'm only laughing because you've got a certain Usain Bolt behind you giving you bunny ears. <laughs> well, you know, he's just mad at me because I'm, look, I'm looking so cute today. It's a new, a new, new style. <laughs> Now, you're saying three gold medals, two world records. Have you even surpassed your own expectations here? Yeah, definitely. I wasn't, I wasn't really thinking that much of the champion. I just wanted to come in and get three gold medals because uh, I wasn't feeling in the best of shape coming into this, but I was in good shape. But I got it done, so I'm just happy with myself. So now a word to all your fans back in Britain, because you've got many. You know, Jamaica is hugely popular. We're getting so many emails for you guys. Yeah, definitely. Uh, the fans, definitely, we, we love them. Uh, we know that in 2012 Olympics is going to be crazy because there's a lot of Jamaican there. I really stand up for supporting us so we continue just doing our best. Congratulations to all you guys. Well done. Thank and you. We can... Thank you. <laughs> well done. I love you, Britain. <laughs> Thank you very much. I love you guys. <laughs> Hello, Jamaica. Hello, Britain. Welcome, Jamaica. Bring. I love you too. Don't feel that like I don't love you. <laughs> You're my homeland. I love you guys. Peace. Sensational, really. And uh, here is Bolt and his crew, Freighter and Pal. Uh, Steve Mullins absent for not quite sure what reason. But anyway, there's the three Jamaicans. You can see the British boys on the right picking up their bronze medals, but there is Bolt, his third gold medal of these games to go with the three that he won in Beijing. And it's a, an interesting thing to discuss here about what Bolt does next, purely in terms of in the short term and the long term. You know, if you were managing Usain Bolt, I cannot imagine how many offers, not just of endorsements, but actually of race offers, run in this meeting, you must come to this Grand Prix, you must do this, we need you here. What advice would you offer the people who are advising Bolt about what direction to take his career in the short term? I, I would really look at, next year is an off year, there's no major championship, and for him to, I think the most important thing for him is going to be to remain motivated. And, you know, for most athletes, the average athlete is striving to win their first gold medal at an Olympics, a world championship, or chasing after world records, which usually takes several years. And he was able to come into the sport and, and accomplish all of that right away. This was really the last step, the last major thing to win world championships. And he did that here. So in order to maintain some motivation and some desire, he has to limit, I would limit the amount of races. Next year, I would probably limit the races to maybe only Commonwealth Games or only you know, exhibition races like the 150 meter race up in, uh, in Manchester last year and do that sort of thing for a year or move to the 400. But I think the most important thing is going to be to really manage his future so that he has a, so they can have some longevity in this one and remain motivated and have goals. But it's interesting, Michael, talking about limiting the number of races because every race promoter in the new Diamond League that's, that's coming up and the Commonwealth Games, of course, you know, which is going to be crucially important, I think, for, for them in India, they will want Bolt to be there. And so prioritising is going to be very difficult. Yeah, it has to be very difficult for him. But, you know, I think Michael said really is the truth. You've really got to make sure that he does the right things for Usain Bolt so he maximises his potential, not only on the track, but in the marketplace too. So for me, it would be for him to, to really plan his next four years up to 2012 Olympic Games, which is, is the vital thing because very rarely you see somebody uh, retain their 100 and 200 metre Olympic titles. So that's an objective for himself in itself. And we saw in the medal ceremony there, there, of course, that the British quartet were just to the right of uh, the Jamaicans. I know you're saying it's a devalued medal, Michael, because the Americans weren't there, but uh, no, nonetheless. No, 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 I'm not saying that at all. I think that uh, they, you've got to get the baton around. That's part, of, that's part of it. So they deserve to be there because the Americans can't get it. And twice, two years in a row now, they couldn't get it around. That's their own fault. They, they, they deserve to be disqualified, rightfully so. Okay. Harris, uh, Harry Akin Tariti, though, you know, young guy, I mean, he's got an immense presence about him. He's one of those guys who you think could be a real talisman for British athletics over the next few years. Oh, yeah, and it's vital, really, um, that these guys are not really just satisfied with a bronze medal in the relay, because you can be very easily replaced in a relay team, you know. Only thing that we really remember is the guys who was at Great Britain won a bronze medal, not the four individual runners. So they've got to really think about lifting their own personal careers and sprinting well and getting Get into these kind of championships and get into these kind of finals as individuals and then having the relay just to top it up. OK, well, you mentioned yesterday what a fantastic atmosphere it was in Berlin for the men's marathon, but that was almost doubled today for the women's, where there were more than a million people on the streets of Berlin to watch uh, Shui Bai win the women's marathon and to give China their first gold medal of these championships. She's 20 years old. She beat Yoshimi Ozaki of Japan in the last kilometre across the line in two hours, 25, 15 seconds at the Brandenburg Gate. 
and uh, the Ethiopian Mergia took the bronze. China took the team gold, Japan the team silver, and Russia the team bronze. And worth just saying about Bai, who won the marathon today, she ran her first marathon, wait for this, at the age of 14. <laughs> wow, it's just, there's not much else to say other than wow. Anyway, and six years on, she is the world champion. Anyway, it does seem like an eternity ago now, but it's a week ago that Britain's latest golden girl had her moment in the sun. I'm starting to get really, really nervous. Jessica Ennis is sprinting away here. That is a cracking start to her aspirations to win this world title. Oh, she's got it. Now her lead is up to 181 points. It's nice to start with two of my strongest events. Scared myself so much. That was fast and it's long. I just pulled it together and, and got it in the final rounds. I was so relieved. Jessica Ennis is streaking away here. I can't believe really... <laughs> that. It's just been the best day. Don't mess up. <laughs> tough getting to sleep last night, kind of, everything's going in my head, it's quite hard to switch off. That could be further. A little bit disappointed, wanted a little bit more. It's going to be a nervous couple of hours. Scared. <laughs> the World Championship gold medal beckons. She really means business. Come on, Jess, finish it off in style. We have another world champion. Absolutely brilliant. And doing that lap of honour, and it's the best feeling in the world. It's amazing. I'm the world champion. And all the British team have been saying all week what a huge boost to the morale of the entire squad out here, the victory was. And when you look back on it now, you know, it, it's, it's easy a week on to reflect on the enormity of what she achieved, because relatively inexperienced, even though fancied to win a gold medal on all form, but nonetheless, you know, you've still got to do it, and she did it in real style. Oh, yeah, I mean, it was a, a really great to see Jessica do this. She came into these championships, as you said, as world leader, but once you actually arrive at the championships, everybody's at zero. You have to start all again, you have to perform. And for her to, to start the event as the leader, she won the hurdles, fastest time, and then to finish, when she went to 800 metres, she kept that leader's number the whole way, and I think she wore it very well indeed. It bodes so well for her future, and of course, we wanted to do remarkably well in 2012 because she'll be on our box screens for two solid days, and hopefully she can bring an Olympic gold medal home for us. What did that 800 metres at the end of it tell you about her strength of character, the way that she was determined to be the first across the line? Well, she was determined to be the first across the line, but also knowing that she had something like a 12-second cushion, she still wanted to give the absolute best that she could. She knew that, you know, in all likelihood going into that event, she was going to win the, the event and win the entire heptathlon and had the gold in hand, but still remained focused. There was no smiles. There was no, you know, relaxation. She was still just as focused going into the last and final event as she was at the start of the championships. And I think that that will bode well for her in the future because as she has shown with the talent that she has, she will probably go into the future championships, the next World Championships, Commonwealth Games, Olympic Games as the favorite as well. And she handled that role as favorite very well. Well, if you're going to the Gateshead Grand Prix in a couple of Mondays' time, you'll be able to see Jessica Ennis and all the British medalists here from these championships. And let's hope we're going to have another British medalist at some point in the next hour or so. We've got Lisa Tabriskie coming up in the 1500 metres and Mo Farah goes in the 5000 metres very shortly. And we can talk to Brendan Foster and also to Steve Cram about this. Uh, Brendan, first of all, before we talk about Farah, what about Bikini, who doesn't really have the same persona and the same kudos within the athletic world and yet in many ways is to distance running what Bolt is to sprinting. He is absolutely that. He's win everything he runs he wins. In fact in the interesting thing for me today is that he's won every single title that he's ever gone after except the world championship 5,000 meters. That's what he's about to run now. He's won the 10,000 meters. He's won Olympic gold in the five and the ten he's won the cross country as a junior as a senior short distance long distance he's run won the world indoor title so he's got every single title that's available to him in his bag back there in Addis Ababa except this one and guess what that means 
it means he's going to win. I think that's right. But, but what does it mean for Mo Farah? I mean, realistically, we'd hope he'd finish in the top six. If he pushes himself too hard and tries to get into a medal position, is that, in a sense, running the risk of finding himself out with the also-rans at the end? Well, I think uh, this, this race today is going to be tactical for the first part, I'm pretty sure. And I think Kenanisa Bakili is determined to win this one. He doesn't want to leave it a chance. He's got Elliot Kipchoge, who beat him in the World Championships in the 5,000 metres in Paris, won that magnificent race when he beat, as an 18-year-old, he beat the great El Garouge and he beat Kenanisa Bakili. He's in this one today. And Lagat, the last time he lost to 5,000 metres, Lagat beat him and he's in this race today. So there's some people who he's got to get some revenge on. But at the end of the day, I think the way he runs, if he makes it as fast as we think he will in the later stages, I think that's to Mo Farah's advantage. And I think Mo, you know, will settle off in the first six and eventually I think there's paces to go. And I actually think there's a medal to steal for Mo Farah. He's running really well. well let's hope you're right. It's, as I say, another glorious day. Just one or two errant, errant clouds in an otherwise blue sky. So it's a perfect setting for five finals on the track this afternoon and two field finals, which will be described, first of all, here by Steve Cram. Thank you, John. Good afternoon, everybody. And sit down and enjoy the next couple of hours. Chances for Britain all over the place. We begin in this 5,000 metres. Mo Farah, you can see on that first page of starters, Kenanisa Bekele has been mentioned. Matt Tegan, camp of USA, I think he looked very sharp as well. I think is like Mo Farah, he'll hope he can get amongst the African contingent here. Abdosh, the name there you may recognise, a man who fell in the qualification and chased the pack hard and was actually, he didn't make a qualifying position but was advanced into this final because he was tripped from behind or judged to have been tripped from behind. Elliot Kipchoge, who Brendan was just talking about, great world champion in 2003, one of the great championship races of all time. And uh, Bernard Lagat, the defending champion, won the double in 2007, which of course El Garouz tried to do in 2003. So all eyes on Kenanisa Bekele, and he started the year in a manner in which we were all unaccustomed to, and certainly he was unaccustomed to, people beginning to doubt his ability to come to the World Championships and not only win two gold medals, to win one, even at 10,000 metres, there were those suggesting he might not be at his best, but he proved to be as good as ever, if not even better than ever, and therefore we see him in this 5,000 metre final as well. And it's a, I think, a mouth-watering prospect we have in terms of great, great 5,000 metre runners, that mix of the 1,500 metre speed of Bernard Lagat, Elliot Kipchoge, one of the quickest men of all time, alongside perhaps the greatest, we'll say perhaps because his career will continue and it, we always like to judge people's careers when they're finished. But Ken Nisa Bekele, the greatest distance runner, 5,000 metres, even 3,000 metres, up to cross-country. You were saying earlier, Steve, about the contrast between him and Usain Bolt in terms of fame, as we look at Bernard Legat. But if you look at Bekele's concentration on the star line, he's not quite a Usain Bolt, is he? <laughs> No, and I think he suffers by comparison with Gabriel Selassie only because of that. His exploits are uh, right up there. He hasn't, of course, turned to the marathon yet. And maybe one day, who knows? Well, that's his attempt, Brent. <laughs> Actually, it's getting better, Steve. It's getting better. It's getting better. It's, yeah. See, he agrees. It's getting better. Well, I think sometimes you just have to admire people's athletic ability. We can't all be Usain Bolt. The Mo Farah, picture of concentration there. This is a, an event which he's waited for since last year, as we look at Elliot Kipchoge talking about that race in 2003. 18 years of age, as Brendan was saying, on that great night in Paris on the last lap. El Garouge, I think we all thought he was going to be able to outkick Kipchoge, and that's the interesting dilemma, isn't it? The speed of the fast man versus the endurance of the distance man. Will the race be slow enough that Lagat starts to fancy his chances to use his 1,500 metre speed? He couldn't defend his title at the shorter distance, but he did run well. He took a bronze medal in that final earlier in the week. He'll be really hoping that, as Brendan suggested, the first few laps might be slow, but I'm not sure how long the likes of Kipchoge and Bekele will hang around. Watch out, as I said, we've got high hopes for 
Mo Farah, there are plenty of athletes in this race who will think they've got a chance of taking a medal. There's the three big names and then a host of others who, on their on day, your marks. could well challenge. The 5,000-metre final. <laughs> that championship record, 12.52.79, set in that race in Paris. Not sure we'll see anything like that today, but who knows, Bikili has gone off hard around that first bend. Kipchoge following him, and then on the outside, Bernard Legat leading that group as well, and then once they've run that bend hard, they slow right down as we come through for the first time, 12 laps to go. Well, we've seen him in many, many kinds of races on the country, on the track, indoors and out, five and 10,000 metres. And his traditional opening is to get to the front as soon as he possibly can. Normally, the scenario is to get to the front as soon as he can, and stay there, but um, today he doesn't need to be in front all the time. But I think one of the things that he's going to be carrying with him in this race today is that he needs to make it somewhere in the race. He needs to make it fast enough so that he puts pressure on the Legat and Kipchoge because he knows he can out sprint them, but I think he can out sprint them better in a, in a true run distance race. If it's really slow, I think he'd have a, he could have some questions, but Mo Farah at the back of the pack just sitting there next to Abdosh, who ran such a brave race when he fell over in the heats and came racing back and ran very, very hard all the way there and eventually was reinstated. And I thought that was a great piece of refereeing by the, by the judges, and I thought it was great what they did. Bakili settling down, and he's slowing there at the front. It's the first round of the women's long jump. Brittany Reese of the USA, world leader, seven metres and six. No great championship record, though. Tessa Patrick's stride, <laughs> and that was very, very easy, and it's very, very long. Nadia Gomez there of Portugal, probably the favourite. Six metres, 92. That is a wonderful lead from the American. Well... No great technique from the American, absolutely raw talent. Great speed off the board, there's so much more there. Just about 800 metres completed and it's slow. The first lap wasn't too bad, 64, but look at that one. There's a 75 lap there, 220 through 800 metres. That's probably not quite what we're expecting. And Mo Farah has been happy to stay at the back from the very beginning. Yeah, maybe he knows something we don't know that... Uh, it was going to be this slow, but he's been happy to run just two, three metres off the back of the uh, pack as well, Breno. So I've been watching him through the binoculars just to check he's running OK, but um, it's all right running at the back, but he's about four metres off the back of the pack. Would you do that? Well, you'd be surprised why he's doing that, but he's there, he's not detached at all. But Kenanisa Bikili, you know, when he broke the world record for this event, he averaged 60.7 for every single lap of the track. <laughs> and the last lap of the track, he did 75 seconds, so he's, he's obviously got a range of abilities, but at the moment he's not doing anything serious. Well, he's picked the pace up a little bit. I'm, I'm just a little concerned about Mo Farah. He's, he's having to speed up a bit now to uh, get with this a bit of injection of pace. You can see they're all stretched out. He's right at the very back. I just think if you come into a final and you, if you want to contend that you should be in that group there, feeling as though you're in the race and ready to react, because if something kicks off at the front here, he's got to run almost two seconds quicker on a lap to get up with it, so I'm just a little bit concerned that he's running at the back. It's early days yet, so let's not take it too worried. And um, just watching him there, the, the, uh, that injection of pace by Bekele, he's, he's backed off again, having a little word behind him, and he's playing games a little bit, and I'm pleased to say that Mo Farah is now getting himself into the pack and has decided that next time they go, he's going to be a little bit closer. Well, Kennedy's of Achille seems to be telling, not only leading the race, but he's telling, he's telling them what to do. Settling on the inside, Abdosh, his teammate, I thought he might have some application in this event, but I'm sure the slower it goes for the next couple of laps, the eventually the faster they'll break away and, and try and do the business. But there, Kennedy's of Achille realising he's got to apply himself a little here now, got to get closer. Mo Farah is just one from the back, but he's gradually moving his way through. We come alongside the Australian athlete, Collis Birmingham, and he's been running well this year, and this is, this, but this is going to be a test for him too. 
Uh, Bouya picks the pace up again, and uh, a lot of athletes won't enjoy this, where the pace is going quicker and slower, and I I'm really am worried about Mo Farah. Really, I'm concerned that he's uh, not feeling too good out there. I think he would have wanted to be in with the group here. Matt Tegan camps it towards the back. That's Zelensky of the USA on the inside. Legat's in the group. And Mo Farah looks to me like he's working really hard. And uh, at this stage, Bren, you can understand injection of pace later on, but it hasn't been that fast, and I, I think he should be able to cover that a little bit better. Collis Birmingham is the only athlete behind him. But we'll keep an eye on that. Bikili's now taking, taking it on from Ibuya. Then Zelensky of the USA just sitting there in third place. There's Lagat, Kipchoge moving on the outside. They've got uh, the other Kenyan in there is Chepcock, Vincent Chepcock as well. 61 for that lap, now they're getting serious. And this is the point in the race where Mo Farah can't afford to be in that position for much longer. And if you look at it, they're running 61 at the front. He's got to run 60 seconds just to get on terms with them. And Steve's keeping a close eye on Mo Farah who he's suggesting is going through a bad patch, but I don't know why Mo's giving them this start now. In the early laps, it's not a problem, but now when they're operating this this speed, just imagine it, you've got to run faster than they're doing. Kennedy Zabakili looks over his shoulder and tells Ibuya, come on, it's your turn, I've done my bit. Mo might be uh, just playing a, a canny card here, as we'd say, because uh, when the pace is moving up and down, if you can just stay even paced, then that's uh, good to do. And if he has been going through a bit of a sticky patch at all, he's uh, certainly got himself into a better position. When they slowed up, they got himself back involved in the race, back in the pack, and I think that's a good place to be. Now, is it going to stretch out again? We've had this fast, slow, fast, slow, fast, slow. That's not... A rhythm which most athletes would enjoy, a 64-second lap there. Kipchoge and Abuya just putting some pressure. Three Kenyans all gathered around Bekele. He's been in this position many, many times before. That won't phase him too much. It's a hard way to run a 5,000 metres, to run alternative 61 and then 64-second laps. You've got to get used to the rhythm, and you notice that it's going to change. Sometimes you're hurting, and you think, my goodness, I'm going through a bad patch, but then you realise the pace has been lifted. And now the three Kenyans, they're working as a team. Elliot Kipchoge did his bit, and they've got eight laps to go in the men's 5,000 metres. And this is the kind of distance where athletes can start thinking about making serious attempts. Chepkok does his bit at the front. Bikili's back in fifth place. The former champion is in second place, Elliot Kipchoge. And there Bikili decides, no, you're not doing it, I'm going to have my go again. And here he goes at the front. Now, this might be the time when Kennedy Zabakili tries to make this a long, long, hard run for home. A 64 lap, but the pace has been all over the place. I would suggest that at some point they've run uh, a 200 in just under 30 seconds, and at other times they've run 200 metres in uh, something closer to 40 seconds. And that's the differential we've seen, as we see a little bit of bumping and barging there. Uh, made in of Eritrea, just adrift, and we've just got a quick shot of him, he's not even in that pack, he's right at the back there. So five laps to go, 2,000 metres to go in this 5,000 metre final. Mo Farah right at the back of the group, or towards the back of the group where he's been most of this race. Kennedy Sabakile at the front where he's been most of the time, and Kipchoge Looking at him, there's the big three there, Bakili, Kipchoge, Lagat just on the inside, Kipsiro in the yellow vest of Uganda on the outside, and they're still messing around with the pace. Well, in the past, it was always national teams where athletes worked together and helped one another. It was always either the Kenyans working together or the Ethiopians working together. However, nowadays, these athletes are managed by groups of agents, and the, these two, the first two, Kipchoge and Bakili, are both managed by one of my former rivals, Jos Hermans, so they know each other well, They'll and they are actually helping each other, working together. Even though they're competitive, they both want a hard and a fast run race, and Kennedy's a bikini, he just can't control himself, he doesn't want to be slow, he likes to be quick. And I think here now, with four laps to go, Kennedy Zabakili looking over his shoulder, and now he's beginning to strike. Now he's beginning to apply the pressure. Now he's beginning to push the pace. And I think they're going to have to run fast to get close to him and even to go past him. Mo Farah is in about... Where is he? I can't... Well, he's about sixth place, Brendan. He's uh, right in there in the race. And... Uh, 
as uh, whatever was uh, his tactics earlier on, it doesn't matter. He was very much in the right place. He was coming into a good position down the home straight when they came around with four laps to go. So Mo Farah doing his best to make sure that when the move comes, he's going to be ready. It hasn't really happened yet. It looked as though Bakili was going to stretch them at that point. So, of course, every lap that goes by, Bernard Lagat sitting on the inside, the 1,500-metre specialist in the dark blue of the USA, will become a bigger and bigger threat, the defending champion. Bakili on the inside, Kipchoge, Lagat over on the kerb, Kipsiro in fourth place. Then we've got Abuya, we've got James Qualia from Qatar. Mo Farah just behind them with Selinski of the USA. Mo Farah right in amongst them. Now he's come from a long way back. He took it very easy in the early stages. The race was slow and he wasn't a problem at all. But now the champions are at the front. The world champion for 5,000 metres, the world former world champion for 5,000 metres, and the world champion for 10,000 metres, Kenanisa Bikili, just glancing over his shoulder there. He got a bit of a click on the heels. He wasn't very happy with that. He glared at Lagat. 62 seconds, he's going to have to keep picking it up. He's going to have to keep moving it faster. And he's going to have to run faster than 62 to get rid of this group. This is building to a really exciting climax and one which it's impossible to predict. A big group still as we come down to approach two laps to go in this 5,000-metre final. Mo Farah still there for Great Britain. Bakili at the front, looking as though this is becoming a little bit of hard work for him. Bear in mind, he's had a 10,000-metre final to contend with, 5,000-metre heats. Lagat had three rounds in the 1,500 metres, nowhere near as damaging as running a 10,000, of course. And that looks like, is that a Abuya who's just stepped off? That's a Buya, and uh, it doesn't look as though, uh, well, he started to run again, not quite sure why. He had a little look behind to see whether he was last reali realised he wasn't. So, Bikili at the front, Bren, then Kipchoge and Lagat, the big three right at the four. And Lag Lagat not running great in the 1500 metres, I wonder if it's going to be as good today, or better today, I mean. And on the outside there, Kipchoge, he's, as we look at a Buya there, and Kipchoge, he hasn't had a race coming into this one. Now he's on the shoulder of Kenanisa Bakili. Mo Farah is in a good place, moving up onto the outside. He needs to take closer order, and if he gets a run on the last lap, Mo Farah's in a great position now. He's finally worked himself so that he's close. He's yards only behind the great Kenanisa Bakili. There goes Bakili. He's going to hold it and hold it, and he's going to try and sprint and hold this race right from the start, right from the front. There goes. Mo Farah on the outside, he's got chances now. He's really quick, Mo Farah, but the three of the front are talented and Bekili is coming under a little bit of pressure. Farah's in a good place there. Can he strike from there or is he going to tire from there? What a battle we have before us now. 200 metres to go, Kananisa Bekila kicks hard from the front, Lagat is still there on the inside, Kipchoge looks as though he hasn't got too much left, Kipsiro of Uganda and then Qualia, Lagat the big threat, Kipsiro coming on the outside, Mo Farah just starting to disappear, but here we are, the big battle for the title, the defending champion Lagat, 1500 metre speed against 10,000 metre strength, who's going to win this? Right to the line, Bekili's going to get it, strength outlasts the speed, Bekili is the double champion. What a race from the two of them. Brilliant, brilliant, brilliant. I thought just for a moment that Lagat had the pace, but it came down to strength and guts and determination and, of course, no mean ability. Kenanisa Bekele, the double gold medalist. Mo Farah, you think, seventh or eighth? Seventh place for Mo Farah. I'm not sure he was at his best today, Mo, and he maybe would have enjoyed if you'd said beforehand this is going to come down to a last lap sprint, but that's what it was, Bren, and everybody became involved. Lots of athletes had a chance with 250 metres to go, but they couldn't get past this man. You know what, Bren, it always reminds me of a 5,000 metre Olympic final. Lassie Vera in 1976, when they were queuing on his shoulder to get past, they were queuing on the shoulder of Kenanisa Bekele, and they couldn't get past him. And I'm still queuing. I was queuing then, Steve, I'm queuing now. But this was a great, great race. That was a fantastic performance by Lagat. And we're looking at the split times, and they are pretty incredible. The race was slow and slow, and then gradually just began to pick up. And then we saw a really honest race, a true race. And we looked at the champion trying to defend his title, and there they go into the 
up to the bell on the inside. Kenanisa Bakili, he's been leaning for a couple of laps. He's been gradually screwing the pace up. 63, 62, then 61. And now he's trying to hold them from the front. He's kicking again. Every time he's challenged, he seems to have a response. But the talent is already there at the front. Mo Farah is in about sixth or seventh place. And as they're operating down the back straight, that's putting Mo Farah under pressure. They're really sprinting flat out. Elliot Kipchoge is trying to get past. Ken Lisa Bakili won't let him. Lagat drifts through on the inside. He's extremely lucky with that one. And even more lucky than his countryman. Elliot Kipchoge gives him a yard or two there. And now into the straight. He's looking confused over his shoulder. What's he going to see? And what he sees is the 1,500-metre man, the former world 1,500-metre champion, now takes the edge, has an inch ahead of him, and Kenanisa Bakili responds. It's strength and speed and determination. And this man, he decides he's unbeatable, he becomes unbeatable. And that was all about determination. That was all about becoming the first Ethiopian to win the world title at 5,000 metres, to win the only title he's never won before, the World Championship 5,000 metres. And at this point, Laga thought he was going to win it, he thought he had it. But then the great man, I want this title, I can hold it, just holding his pace, not panicking, not doing anything special there, just sprinting like he's done before, and then the inches pull ahead, and he's a relieved man. And people don't realise, you know, he's a great athlete, he wins all of his races, but what they don't realise is what a competitor he is. He's not just a great physical athlete, he's an utterly determined, mentally committed athlete. And the great ones, they just get used to winning. It's a fantastic habit winning, and he's certainly got it. Well, we've had one or two poor finals in the distance events here, but not that one, that was an absolute screamer. Kenanisa Bekele takes two gold medals, adds to his collection, 13-17-09, 53.9 for the last 400 metres, 26.1 for the last 200, absolutely incredible, pushed all the way by a resurgent Bernard Lagat of the USA taking the silver medal. James Qualia, former Kenyan, now running for Qatar, took the bronze, and then Mo Farah in seventh place, place and Mo Farah is now with Phil. Well, Mo, it's 53.9 for that last lap from Bakili to win it. Uh, you were in contention there. Tell me what you're thinking as you're coming to the bell. I was coming, I was going to the bell thinking, yeah, I can stay with him. But I tried, but my legs were just... I just didn't have that. Where well, it was like on... In the heat, I was a lot more bouncier. And I could have run that if that was the final, but at the same time, I think it just take that, that little bit out of me. But that's, these guys are the best, so... So how were you feeling generally during the race? We saw your tactics where you, you, you dropped back a little bit, gave yourself a couple of yards at the back of the field. How were you feeling then? I was just trying to... I feel a little bit tired, but I was trying to freshen up a little bit and stay at the back and just don't do... keep jerking. So I was thinking just stay there, save energy, and then when, when they go, try and go with them. So you're saying basically today you didn't feel as sharp as you would have liked and hoped? Yeah, that's what... But it really just wasn't that. But at the same time, you know, I tried to give myself a chance and cover every move, but... I just couldn't go with it. Well, you gave it your best shot, Mo. Seventh in the world, not too shabby. Yeah, quite disappointed, but at the same time, this is the best of the world, so I think there's more need to be done and keep training and, yeah, definitely. All the best, Mo. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, Phil. Well, the men's javelin final has just started. The leading throw so far, Tero Pitkamaki, the defending champion, but it's only 81 metres 90. So what can Guillermo Martinez of Cuba do? Cuba have never won a medal in the World Championships in the javelin, but this guy qualified well. And it's over 80 metres. That could be the leading throw so far. In fact, it could be a season's best for the Cuban. Well, this is really set up for a great competition. We've got the double Olympic champion, we've got the defending world champion, Martin Esso, for the moment, in the lead. There's Pickamaki in the background there, the defending champion. Now, penultimate jump in the women's long jump, first round, Lebedeva. The lead, still 6 metres 92 to Brittany Reese, Nadia Gomez, perhaps the pre-event favourite, 6 metres and 77. Lebedeva, a couple of silver medals in Beijing last year, with the Olympic champion in the long jump 2004. 
a Russian clean sweep. Got a bronze medal in the triple jump as well. Very, very powerful. She was disappointing in the triple jump, though, here. Came down in sixth place, 14.37, well below her season's best. We're told that she had her back, back problems during that final, but they've eased off. Six metres and 78 into second place in these early stages. The Olympic champion twice. An absolutely superb physical specimen is Andreas Torkelson. Poor throw in the first round. Oh, he put the brakes on. He's really unloaded that one, my goodness. Way, way out there. And that is long. That is going to be tough to beat. That is close to 90 metres. Well, that was brilliant, wasn't it? Absolutely brilliant from the double Olympic champion. Never won the world, so 89-59, season's best. That will be hard to beat. Absolutely superb. Came charging in, wraps the javelin, and then hits it hard. On balance at the end, superb, absolutely superb. Well, Terra Pitkamaki, the defending champion, Well, Lisa Brisky goes in the 1500 metres in about 10 minutes' time, and there have always been question marks on occasions about her tactical now. She is the Commonwealth champion, but today is the moment when she has to put those doubts to one side and prove that she can get a medal on the world stage. As I say, that's 10 minutes away. That was a great 5000 metre race. You know, some people say distance races can be boring, and sometimes they can be a little bit one dimensional, but that was just fantastic. And it doesn't matter how many thousands of miles you do on the road, week in, week out. The words that Brendan Foster used were uh, the mental commitment and determination of Bikini was amazing. Uh, Kennedy for Bikini is just an incredible athlete, just showing there that he can come down from 10,000 metres down to 5,000 metres. The difference between Kennedy for Bikini and everyone else, and Bernard Lagarde is a 1,500 metre runner, so. This is one of the best in the world in terms of this part of the race when it sprints. But look at Kenanisa Bikaili in the trail leg, how tight it comes in to his hip. I mean, because he's able to sprint. That's why he's able to move away at this point after having already run 4,900 meters. In the last 100 meters of this race, still able to out sprint the rest because he, he's, he's built like a sprinter. He has the leg recovery of a sprinter. But then it goes back to what Brendan was saying. He has the determination. He does not want to lose. He will not lose. He will will himself to the finish line no matter what he has to do. He has that belief. And, you know, people say how much of it is physical and how much of it is mental. He's one of those athletes who takes that approach that, hey, I want to be 100 percent proficient in both areas. We saw Bernard Lagat's eyes there just popping out of his head. He must have been so demoralised when Bikini came back at him. Hang on a moment. We can, we can actually hear from Bikini at this moment. Kennedy, so once again, many congratulations for a wonderful performance. Tell me uh, that, that final bit of the race when you got Bernard Lagat chasing you down, what determination there was from you? Uh, you know, the, the, I know Bernard Lagat is, you know, it's very tough, uh, especially in sprinting. So. Uh, it's because he's a 1,500-meter runner, so it's better that better sprint than me. So because I'm distance runner, so. But you know, I, you know, I beating him, you know, on the sprint. So, so it shows what a special athlete you are. Yes, yes, because you know it's fantastic. You know, I'm so happy. And to do the double, two gold medals yet again, and you, the, the legend continues to grow. Yes, you know, I'm so happy. Uh, really, you know, uh, for myself, for my country, you know, it's double gold, you know, it's two gold, you know, for my country. So, uh, gold, you know, only my, you know, event is we get uh, gold up to now. So, uh, now only one race, 1500 meters women left, but, you know, I hope maybe we can get some uh, more medals. So. Well, it's a magnificent achievement. Congratulations. Thank you very much. Thank yeah, you. Bye -bye. So two gold medals for Bikini and obviously two gold medals for Great Britain so far in these championships. We spoke about Jessica Ennis earlier on. And here's a piece now about our hop, stepper and jumper. Well, we've been talking about this man's potential to win a major title for years. Will he deliver? A lot depends on which Philip Sado who's turned up to the stadium this evening. There are the two men who battled it out in Beijing, and they're at it again here in Berlin. That's a great start from the reigning champion.
Henry just sing early, just chopping for the ball, and Bickhoff and Step! Oh, we will take that. And Evora knows it's game on. Evora just sits and waits. Come on. Better hop to the step. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. That could be the biggest jump of Philip Sado's career. He's in the gold medal position for the time being. But can the Olympic champion, Evora, respond? And it is not good enough. Felix Idowu is the world's champion. I've been waiting to say that for a long, long time. Do you know what? I think he's overwhelmed. You know, he is. I think he's close to tears. Wonderful moments for Felix Idowu. He's got a big smile now. I knew this was my time. I knew this was my time. Top step jump, 17, 77, simples. It's been a long time coming, man. Well, Jonathan Edwards is an obvious man to talk to about Philip Sado, and he said there that he felt this was his time, but was there a nagging fear for you that if he hadn't won here, that maybe that elusive global championship might actually not come his way at any point? And I think it's a fair point. I think he has been vulnerable when the pressure has been on. And that's why I thought Beijing was so important. important. And he was sort of frustrated and disappointed with how he performed. But I felt this would set him up for the next four years through to 2012. Because I think it gave him the confidence. You go away from an Olympic Games with a silver medal, you really have achieved something. So I think that was really important in his whole development. And, uh, of course, now he's got that monkey off his back. I think he really could go on and jump a long way. All right, thank you very much. Well, we've had three individual medalists for Great Britain so far during these championships. Ennis, Ido, and obviously Jenny Meadows. And her bronze medal was rather overshadowed by the great Furore in the middle of the week. But let's not take anything away from her. It was an immensely gutsy performance, and that finish was just fantastic. I think Jenny Meadows could get a medal. Jenny Meadows in the pack. I think you'll find that Jenny Meadows is running a pretty even race. Jenny Meadows on the shoulder of the Russian, but Semenya is away and gone. Behind her, the scraps off for the medals, and Jenny Meadows is right in amongst it. It comes Jenny Meadows, will she get there? She does! Well done, Jenny Meadows. Fantastic. Brilliant, brilliant run. It's an absolute dream come true. I can't believe I got the bronze. It was amazing getting the flag, and I could tell each and every one of them was so generally thrilled for me. So, yeah, dream come true. So Jenny Meadows may have got the bronze, but Carsta Semenya's gold medal for South Africa obviously attracted the attention of the world's media. And in the last half hour, a statement's been issued by the IAAF president, Lamine Diak, saying that an internal inquiry is going to be launched into how this whole row was handled. Uh, she won the 800 metres, obviously, on Wednesday night, just hours after the IAAF had confirmed that she was the subject of an official investigation into her gender. And Diax uh, has said this afternoon, I deeply regret that confidentiality was breached in this case and that the IAAF were forced into a position of having to confirm that gender testing was being carried out on this young athlete. It is a very regrettable matter. Uh, so, Steve Cram and, uh, and Brendan... First of all, thoughts on what Diak has said this afternoon, that it's, it's not a question of the issue, it's a question of how the issue was handled. I think you're right, uh, John. I was chatting to um, one or two people from the IWF last night and they were holding their hands up very much, as Diak has said, saying that uh, they got it horribly wrong. But I think also the South African Federation will have some uh, tough questions aimed at them as well in this inquiry as to um, how much... Um, they were responsible for putting Semenya in the position in which she found herself at these championships. So I don't think anyone has come out of this um, smelling of roses, as it were, I, except that I think her dignity through it all is something which a lot of people have admired. I think it's an incredibly difficult position she was, she was put in. I think the other thing to say is um, I'm also told that it's a highly unlikely, in fact, uh, it will be impossible uh, for them to come back and retrospectively change the result here. So she will take a gold medal away. What happens to her in the future is another matter, I think. And I think it did open up a wider issue as to how they want to handle this. Um, I'm aware of, been made aware of at least three or four other instances like this which have kept, been kept completely out of the 
uh, public awareness over sorry, the last three sorry or four to interrupt, years. Steve. Sorry, sorry, when you John. say three or four, four other instances, do you mean three or four other gender issues that have been kept under wraps? I don't know any names or anything. I've just been told that this is not as unusual as, as perhaps uh, we might believe and that uh, certainly things like this are, are dealt with in the way that they should be dealt with in a very discreet manner by federations uh, before they ever arrive at a scenario like we have here. We are under world championships with the world's media here. And unfortunately, of course, the spotlight was turned on a particular young athlete who was brought to these championships when... Um, that people were allowed to ask questions about her eligibility. And of course the IWF then reacted to that, as they've, they've just explained themselves. They got it horribly wrong by disclosing information that they, they shouldn't have been um, disclosing to, to the media. OK, well that was the women's 800 metres. Let's hope there's 1500 metres as just talked out about in terms of who actually wins it and who doesn't. And Lisa Dabrisky, Brendan, this is her moment when opportunity knocked in a very big way. I really think it is. She's had a bit of a troubled season, she's been injured, but she's obviously coming right now. I just hope she doesn't run out of legs today, because sometimes when you've had an interrupted approach to the, to the big one and you run three rounds, then sometimes it can affect you. However, there's Jamal, the defending champion, and Burka of Ethiopia, who are the two outstanding athletes. But I honestly believe that Lisa Dabrisky, if she runs an untroubled race, follows the pace, finds a way so that she doesn't have a wall of athletes in front of her, which she often has too often for me, then I think she can run a great race. I think she can get a medal and maybe even better than that. OK, well, describe it for us, guys, and let us hope that this is the fourth individual medal of these championships for Great Britain. Well, some very late news which will help that situation is that Shel Souli of Morocco is a very late withdrawal from this final. So that means uh, if we look down the list there, Lisa Dabrisky has... Uh, some very good athletes against her. Dekimovan, Rodriguez, Shannon Robri. Jamal will start as the favourite. There's the withdrawal of Selsuli with Thomas and Berka, the other name on there. Lisa Dubrisky, as Brendan was saying, uh, with a huge opportunity. Let's put this into perspective, though. She's been struggling with injury and has really been lightly raced, but has got better with every single race. There are still four or five women in this field who've run quicker than Lisa this year. And three or four who have beaten her. London and Monaco, but that won't phase her. She knows that standing on the start line here, she has a huge opportunity, and I'm very confident she'll run a very, very good race. Hojetska of Poland, a veteran of major championship finals, used to be very dangerous in slow run races, not as quick these days as she used to be. Gezahain from Ethiopia, just 18 years of age, took a silver medal at the World Juniors last year where she was beaten by Steph Twell, nonetheless, no less, and Steph didn't run very well in the qualification here. She'll be very disappointed she's not in this final. Shannon Robry of the USA has been having an excellent year, US champion. Not the quickest of the Americans, but uh, did win their trials. Rodriguez, Spanish record holder. Does a good job of getting into finals. It's, uh, hasn't been better than sixth of, so far in Worlds or Olympics. Evtekimova, an habitual front runner. So it would be no surprise to see the tall Russian go to the front early. And the Americans have got three athletes in this 1500 final. Anna Willard, that new personal best, 4-1.44. And that was done. She finished just one place ahead of Lisa Dabrisky in their last race before these championships in Monaco. The defending champion and undoubtedly the favourite, Mariam Jamal from Bahrain. But if you can remember what happened last year at the Olympics, she started as the favourite there and faded rather badly, wilted. I couldn't quite read that, Christy, but... I think it said believe, I'm being told. I wasn't quite sure what she had written on her hand, but believe indeed, she will believe she has an excellent chance. Under four minutes this year, that big step forward for her. And then the distance talent of Galita Berka of Ethiopia, another athlete who will want a good, strong pace, I would think. Berka will not really want to leave it to the big kickers like Dabrisky. Fernandez on the inside, the only one that uh, we didn't see there. The nerves will be rattling. On your marks. Back, go back, please. Well, the, Four. 
the release that that Four. gun gives you these last few moments are ones you just want to get over with and get into the race. <laughs> I think next year that will be a disqualification if uh, the new rules are as I understand them. Even the distance runners will not be allowed to have a false start, which I think is a bit your silly. Marks. Here we go. Women's 1500 final. Lisa Dubrisky from Loughborough, coached by George Gandhi, fourth in the Olympics last year, looking to go at least one better here in Berlin. Moves towards the back of the field at this point, but that's OK, it's very slow, a bit of pushing and shoving. You have Dekimova, the tall Russian, just want to give herself a bit of room. Doesn't really want to lead, does she? she was hoping someone else would come through, but finds herself in the lead on this first lap. Berka alongside her, Jamal, the defending champion in the red and white, just giving Kristen Wirth Thomas a bit of a nudge there as we've got a very slow first lap. That's no surprise, Brendan, in a 1500 final. Well, because they look at it and you're not sure of who's going to try and lead for a long way. Berger, I think, out of these is the strongest and a longer distance race. You definitely favour uh, Berger. She's a, an athlete with great endurance as well as speed. She finds herself in the, in the 1500 because she's not good enough to get alongside Melkamu and De Defa and Debaba in the 5,000. So she's moved to the 1,500, really, concentrating on it. She was a world cross-country champion. And there, in the middle of the field, Lisa Dabrisky on the outside. She said the other day, I love running on the inside. And I was just hoping that occasionally she would just stay a little bit away from the inside. At the moment, she's chopping her stride. It is slow. She's in a position, but remember, She's the athlete with the armory. She's got a wonderful sprint finish over the last 200 metres. And the way the pace is going, she might get a chance to use it. I'm never too nervous about the first two laps. I always think the third lap, get yourself into a good position. Be in a good position as you approach the bell, slow or fast. You don't want to give anyone too much of a head start. Lisa Dabrisky taking the short route on these first couple of laps, which is OK, but next time round, She'll need to start thinking about what sort of position she wants to adopt for when they come round to the bell, particularly if it stays this slow. Berka in the lead, Evdekimova of Russia, then Jamal on the outside. On the inside, there's Fernandez of Spain. Then we've got Lisa Dabrisky just tucked in there on the inside still. Rodriguez just starting to try and close her out. There's Worth Thomas of the USA has just gone past Dabrisky down the back straight. And they're just starting to wind it up. Berker's just slowly picking up the pace here, and away she goes. And she's stretching the field out. And now Lisa Dabrisky is in a strong position there. Just slipping through the gap again. She's pretty good at that. Jamal strike, striking and stretching. Now Berker's making a long run for home. Looking over her shoulder, she'll see her former countrywoman, Jamal, in second place. Then you have, you have Doc him over on the inside, and then Lisa Dabrisky. The two Ethiopian-born athletes are leading this one, and now Lisa, just slip out there, get into that gap, and just move a little bit closer. She's got to do this, because I think she's got to give herself a, a shooting chance against these two Ethiopians in the last 200 metres. Now, gradually, moving through to fourth, then to third, and in the back straight, she'll have a chance to pounce. Now she moves into a medal position. She's strong enough and fast enough. Can she get there? Lisa Dabrisky moves into third place. Berker's in the lead. Jamal, the defending champion, with Lisa Dabrisky hovering. Rodriguez on the inside. Shannon Robry is going with this. Five of them pulling away. Berker's doing her best to run the legs out of the sprinters, and look at this right on the inside. That was terrible from the Spanish athlete. Pushed Berker over. Lisa Dabrisky kept out of trouble, though. Rodriguez will be in trouble for that, I'm sure. Wait for that afterwards. Jamal, Rodriguez, and Lisa Dabrisky on the outside with Shannon Robry of the USA. Jamal looks over her shoulder. This is where she's weak when she comes under pressure. Rodriguez of Spain, and here comes Lisa Dabrisky. Here's a chance. Robry on the inside. Rodriguez is kicking away. Jamal's fighting back, Dabrisky's in third, trying to get second, Rodriguez is going to win this one, Jamal in second, Dabrisky third, Robry fourth. That is a result which I'm tentatively going to say would stand, but I think Rodriguez will now have a nervous wait because I think she tried to cut through. Yeah, well done, Lisa, you got in the top three. But Rodriguez on the back straight, Ben, will have a look at it. 
There was a gap there which I'm not sure Rodriguez was entitled to go for and gave Berker a big push in the back. She went down and uh, obviously her race was over. Lisa Dabriskie was in a good place, reacted well, didn't quite have enough in the home straight to get past Jamal, but let's have a look at this, Brent. And there we are, there's Rodriguez on the inside, Berker leading as she's trying to do, do for the last lap and a half, and then a, a push, just a little bit of hustle and bustle, a push from Rodriguez, Berker steps on on the inside, interferes with Jamal, and fortunately Lisa Dabriskie is in a good place there, as Berker falls, Lisa steps onto the right-hand side, steps away from it, Rodriguez gets herself in trouble, Worth Thomas is attacking Lisa Dabriski. and now let's look back, that was the fall, that was the incident, let's look back, now Lisa's just giving them just a few too many yards here at this point, stretching herself, running strongly, moving up, but Burke is running, making a bid to go for home, but the Bahrainian athlete, former Ethiopian athlete Jamal in second place and Lisa Dabriskie's done it right from here she's in a good place she's on the outside she's got that powerful sprint finish maybe a couple of weeks of training missing but however she's put herself where she needs to be and at this point she's got great chances there's Rodriguez on the inside coming through slips through behind Jamal and then pushes Berger in the back and over goes Jalita Berger out steps Lisa Dabriskie Jamal finds herself clear Berker gets up and continues running, and here comes the race. Jamal, Rodriguez, Robri, and Lisa Dabriskie into the finishing straight. Rodriguez sprinting, going for it. Jamal hanging on, Lisa Dabriskie attacking once more, driving at Jamal, the defending champion, almost stride for stride just leaning and pushing and it's so so close Jamal holds off Lisa Dabriski and if we look at this again we'll see there we are in the back straight there's Rodriguez she just pushes Berger in the back and there's no way the smaller figure of Jalita Berger goes to the track and they were fortunate behind Jamal was fortunate Rodriguez was fortunate and also Lisa Dabriski was extremely fortunate Brent, she hasn't gone on a lap of honour because the crowd started to boo and whistle as the replay was played on the big screen. And uh, Rodriguez is still standing down as uh, she went to go to Berka. A very, very happy Lisa Dabriskie. She ran a great race, just missed out on second place as it stands, just a hundredth of a second. But this athlete here, Rodriguez, there's no smiles there. She knows this is an uh, unpopular victory, certainly as far as the crowd are concerned. She was booed and whistled, and so she hasn't gone on a lap of honour. This will be one the judges will have to look at. But at the moment, Lisa Dabriskie, no matter what, she's got a medal. It's a bronze medal at the minute. Really, really good run. But hundredth of a second from the silver. We'll have to wait and see what happens. Of course, it's up to the other teams to protest that. Rodriguez takes the gold. Jamal the silver. Lisa Dabriskie with an excellent bronze at the moment. So, into the second round of this women's long jump competition. The lead, still Brittany race, 6.92, followed it up with 6.85. David David, the defending champion. Oh, my goodness! I have to say, after what I saw in the triple jump, Paul, I thought she wouldn't be a factor, but she's absolutely nailed that one. It's close to seven metres, I think certainly is the most talented all-round horizontal jumper in the world that red flag not a foul it's just preventing any other athlete come down 6.97 a season's best the Russian goes into first place fantastic Well, the news uh, we're just getting is that there was indeed a red flag went up from uh, one of the judges, so that means the track referee will be having a look at the incident and will be making a decision on it, but it's certainly an infringement which was picked up by one of the judges. So um, if uh, Phil can maybe relay that, relay that to I'm sure an already happy Lisa Dabriskie, but it might get better yet.
Uh, thanks for that, Steve. The news is, Lisa, you've got a bronze medal. Congratulations on that. It could yet be a silver because the red flag went up and the referees are looking into the incident involving the Spanish athlete. Okay, so, at the top end. At the top end, okay. so you avoided that brilliantly. You yeah. come home with a medal. So tell me about just winning a medal of any colour, first of all. Oh, I'm chuffed a bit, you know. Um, oh, it was just such a, the race was so surreal. It kind of went by without me even noticing it. And I just needed to get a medal after last year. You know, I was so, so disappointed to finish off and I just didn't want to finish in that position again and um, you know I, I owe so much to everyone and I just really thought if I could win a medal it would just reward them and say th uh, like a big thank you so yeah I'm so chuffed <laughs> Well remind people at home just what you've been through this year to even get here you've had you've had a terrible year with injury Yeah it's been a bit of a nightmare actually I started out the winter with a stress fracture in my lower back um, so I was out through the whole of Christmas and sort of pretty much three months out of the sport kind of well still kind of doing a lot of rehab and swimming and aqua jogging and and things but it was difficult to train because it's a uh, weight bearing bone there's not very good blood supply to the sacrum so the healing process wasn't as quick as say your standard kind of bone so that was that and then throughout end of May I ended up picking up a bone stress in my left thigh so that kind of set me out the early part of June which is why I had to miss the trial so it's been a complete nightmare <laughs> but um well now here you are with a medal after all of that yes um tough to bit you know um I can't quite take it in at the moment. It's a bit strange, but um, I have to sort of. There's so many people I need to thank, and uh, particularly my family, um, Rob Chakravarti, Renee Thompson, and undoubtedly my coach George Gandhi, who have got me here. And just to get me on the start line this year was a major achievement. So I owe them so much. So I'm very grateful. Well done. Thank the whole you. nation's behind you. Congratulations. Thank you very much. Thank you, Bill. Thank you, Bye. Congratulations indeed, and uh, in advance to Lisa and. Uh, Fiance Ricky, we're getting married later in the year, but look at this. This is the incident on the back straight. Rodriguez, the gold medal winner, pushing Berker quite clearly in a position where there was no gap on the inside. And uh, well, we're waiting to hear the final decision from the referee. Well, in second place now, Brittany Reese. Behind Lebedeva, very quick. Oh, it's big. Well, what a talent this young lady is. Uh, I think it's the former leader, Lebedeva. Brittany Reese, wonderful speed on the run up. There's a coach, I'm not quite sure what he does because he hasn't got much technique. I guess you could say she jumps ugly, but the result was gorgeous, wasn't it? Absolutely superb. Oh. She flew through the air. But she knew it as soon as she landed. Timed it absolutely perfectly. What could she jump with the technique? Seven metres and ten. World leading jump in first place. Well, we've had two fantastic races on the track so far. The 5,000 for men, the 15,000 for... 1,500 even for women. And we've got the 800 for men coming up now, Borzhakovsky for Russia, but this really is absolutely wide open, could be anybody's medals, that's coming up in a quarter of an hour's time. Uh, right, disqualification, yes, no? Absolutely, absolutely, that was, I mean, that's, it's very unfortunate for Berka, who probably could have won it, and, and there, was, there was no room on the inside, I mean, not only once was there a push, twice there was a push, first, you have no, there's no gap there to go, that's the first push, and then pushing the athlete again when she's off balance, so it's just, I mean, it's probably one of the most blatant infractions I've seen in, in athletics ever. I mean, it was there was just no gap there. There was no room there at all. You can see when athletes start to kind of get tangled up or what we've seen in these championships where an athlete is running on the heels of another athlete. That's an honest mistake. But this one, um, it's, just, it's just a blatant infraction. Ronaldo would certainly have gone down there, Colin, wouldn't he? Yeah, you need a, you know, a dive, that's a dive and a half, that one, isn't it? But definitely a penalty there, I mean, if you put it in football terms. Um, it's, it's always a shame because you're talking about this is the World Championships after all, and all these athletes have trained really hard to get in that final and run the possibly best they possibly can. So, unfortunately for them, it's a, it's a really ugly situation. But for Lisa, look what she did. She originally kept pounced on the situation instantly, got back on Rodriguez's shoulder there and, and just tried her best and, and kept her head, really. She knew she, what she had to do at this stage. Jamal is always slightly vulnerable here with people on her shoulder, but Lisa stuck into it. And you know what? If she does end up getting that silver medal, she's going to be absolutely gutted because she was a tiny smidge, a jiffy away from the gold. Well, she was a hundredth of a second off silver. 
and, and she doesn't dip either, does she? The Kenyan dips for the line, and she doesn't. Well, you know, it's quite difficult to dip when you're, you're really so tired. But you can see Jamal there, she just dipping, putting her head down there, and that could be the crucial thing. That means the difference between gold and silver for Lisa Dabrowski. But with all the problems she's had this winter, I think she's satisfied with, with bringing home some piece of metal. But it's definitely a silver for Dabrowski as far as we're concerned. Yeah, I think so. I, I think the other athlete will be disqualified. And I mean, she went over to uh, to Berka afterwards to, to apologize, I would assume. And I, I would hope that if she didn't get disqualified, she'd give the medal back because it would be the right thing to do. OK, we will find out, obviously, as and when. Right? And let's hope that they don't take too long uh, before deciding that so that we actually can decide it during the next hour or so, as opposed to dragging on after the championships have been and gone. Right, moving on, let's uh, head off to events earlier this week. He's actually been here once today just to pick up a medal, but these whole championships, never mind the bear, have revolved around the world's fastest man. This is what we've waited for, the showdown. The fastest men in the world are here in Berlin. It's packed full of talent, no matter where you look. All of the swaggering and stops. Usain Bolt, number one. Usain Bolt, the world record holder. Is he relaxed? Yeah, I think he I'm is. Ready. Extremely powerful and very, very quick. Powerful, strong, compact. If that is a sign of things to come in the final, we could be in for something very special indeed. Ready. Bolt versus Gay. Bolt is loaded, the World 100 meter final. They get away first time, Tyson Gay right alongside Usain Bolt, but here he goes, streaking away already. It's Bolt all the way, he's looking round at Gay, watch the clock. It's gold for Bolt, and again, he's done it again. A new world record for Usain Bolt. Can you believe it? He is flying. The world belongs to Bolt, Berlin belongs to Bolt. 9.58, stunning, absolutely stunning. He is brilliant beyond compare. We have seen nothing like this ever, ever. A 200 meter final. It's all about Usain Bolt. And away he goes. Two metres clear, three metres clear, five metres clear. Five gold medals, five world records. 19.19. Number one, don't forget. Look at the start. He's already made up the stagger on all of the athletes at this point. This is the most incredible bend ever. Knows he's running faster than he's ever run before. Unbelievable. You just sort of stand back and marvel, don't you? I was talking to John Regis a couple of nights ago, the British, still British 200 metre record holder, and he was saying that he thinks one of the legacies of Bolt might be that whereas in days gone by all sprinters were kind of six foot, six foot one, of a certain kind of middleweight boxing kind of build, and that people who were six feet five, six feet six thought, I can't be a 100 metre sprinter because I can't get out of the blocks quickly enough. What Bolt has done is that kids who might play basketball or whatever else it might be otherwise might look at that and say, actually, that my, my height and my build does not preclude me from being a sprinter so that we could, in five, ten years' time, have everybody in the 100 metres, six feet five, six feet six, which is an, it, it, a fascinating thought, isn't it? Yeah, but I don't, I don't think that will happen because I think that, uh, you know, prior to 
the whole era where the drive phase, the first 30 meters of the, the 100 meters became so important where the more compact sprinters had an advantage. And, and most coaches then looked for that type of build in an athlete. People did like the, the, the longer stride and the, and the athletes with longer, longer limbs. And I think that the thing that makes you need Usain Bolt so unique is that he does have that stride length and he is able to turn over quickly with it. Most people can't do that. There are many, many six foot five inch athletes out there, but they're not quick. They're not fast. They're not able to, and that's what makes him unique. He has the unique combination of quick turnover with the long stride. And that is just in simple terms why he is so much better than everyone else. And, and, and every six foot five inch person is not going to have that. In fact, most of them won't have that quickness. If you were one of the guys who, let's face it, are phenomenally fast, Colin, who are running you know, nine eight, and yet are seeing this guy just disappearing off into the distance, a bit demoralizing, you would think. What, what can they do to try and narrow that gap? There's not much they can do, honestly, um, because he's, what he has is God-given, and they can only deal with what they actually have got themselves. So, you know, they can try and improve their stride length, they can increase their flexibility, they can get more power, but will that get them that much closer to Usain Bolt? At this moment in time, I'd say no. One of the great things about Bolt during the course of this nine days, of course, is that his, his legacy is that he just changes the mood of everything that's around him. And so this championship really has been just one long party. I wish the camera at the beginning had been on me a bit more because I had a little routine to do. One serious piece of news away from uh, all the fun and games we've had here is that six athletes from these championships uh, were arrested today after a fight at a Berlin disco, according to the police. Uh, they're being investigated on possible charges of disturbing the beast, the beast, the peace, and causing bodily harm. Uh, the athletes have not been identified by name, but they're one American, three guys from the Bahamas, and two from Cuba. So, latest news on that. No latest news on the 1500 metres where we're expecting a disqualification, which would mean that Lisa Dabriskie would get a silver medal, but presumably in the uh, corridors of power they're discussing exactly what they're going to do about that. In the meantime, it's the men's 800 metres out on the track now, and Paul Dickinson is your man. Thank you, John. Well, everybody agrees on one thing as far as this race is concerned. It's fairly unpredictable. There's Rodriguez. And they've been hanging around for quite some time in the mix zone and we'll obviously keep you updated on Lisa Dabriskie's progress. She could end up with a silver medal. All depends what the IAAF do. Could be quite a while, though, before it's settled. Well, uniquely, there are 10 men in this final. I'll tell you why in just a moment, but there is the lineup. Diego and Bram Song go in lane one. Diego, the defending champion. Kamel, lane three, uh, two rather. Lopez, lane three. Borzakovsky in lane four. Lalu in five. Simmons in six. Kivuna in seven. The second Kenyan. Lewandowski of Poland and Malazzi of South Africa in lane eight. There's Lewandowski on the second page. Well, Bram Som and Lewandowski uh, were advanced to the final after being affected by Abu Baker Kharki's fall in the first semi-final. That's why they're there. And there's been a lot of discussion about that. And Bram Som on the inside, European champion. There he is wearing the long black socks. A good athlete, and some would say very, very lucky to be in this final. As far as Lewandowski is concerned, well, he's been in very good shape this season. European under-23 silver medalist this year. Actually, it was a Polish 1-2 on that occasion, but uh, both Bram Som and Lewandowski. Bram Som in particular, I think it's a little bit unfortunate that the defending champion, Alfred Kerwer Jago, Alfred Kerwer, has been drawn in the same lane as Som. And athletes don't really like double banking in the lanes. There's Lewandowski just inside him. Very good uh, young Kenyan, 21 years old, Jackson Kavuna. 
We'll be going through the lanes in just a moment. It really is a very open race indeed. Michael Rimmer, Great Britain's representative, while well, he went out in the semi-finals. Said afterwards that uh, it wasn't quite there, just needed to do a bit more work, but he will be back. One or two very, very good athletes in here, including the 1,500-metre champion from Berlin, and that is uh, Yusuf Saad Kamel. See him in just a moment. That's Kerwa, who won this in 2007 in Osaka. Very small, but don't let his size deceive you. He's very, very good on the sprint finish. The defending champion. Hasn't run particularly quick this season. Bram Somm, European champion in 2006. He's a 144 man. And the man outside those two, Yusuf Saad Kamel of Bahrain. His father won this championship twice. The first time he won it, he beat Great Britain's Peter Elliott into second place. And Kamel trying to do the middle distance double of 800 and 1500 meter gold medals. He looks superb in qualification. A very, very talented Cuban out in lane three, Yelma Lopez, Pan American champion. Former 400 meter runner who's moved up very successfully to 800 meters. Then Yuri Bozhikovsky. He's won three medals in World Championship history in the 800 meters, but never the gold. He is, of course, the former Olympic champion back in Athens in 2004. Next, the Moroccan, Amin Lalu, Moroccan 800 meter record holder. Just run outside of his personal best this year at 1.43.36. He's in good form. Well, Nick Simmons is next. The American, the first American to reach the 800 meter final since 1997. He's looked very good in qualification as well. Takes no prisoners. Can really handle himself if there's a tight squeeze. Jackson Kivuna, the second Kenyan. He's based in Paris while he's in Europe. 144.86, his lifetime best, and he did that this year. Then two athletes out in lane eight. Marcin Lewandowski won his European under-23 medal just a few weeks ago, 22 years old. Good prospect for the future, and already this year, he's been under 144. And finally... Olympic silver medalist back in 2004, Mbaleni Malaudzi of South Africa. He's actually made this World Championship uh, final twice before, won a bronze medal back in 2003. In fact, three times before. He was in the Osaka final where he finished seventh. Just makes you wonder how they're going to run this race. Borzhakovsky. We're used to seeing him run at the back, but in both his uh, heat and semi-final, he was a front running, not quite in the lead, but up on the shoulders of the leaders all the way. The men's World Championship 800 meter final. And away they go. Right on the inside there, Kerwa. Just running away from Bram Som a little bit. And right on the outside, Maladzi and Lewandowski. Very tall figure of Lalu. The Moroccan is there. Very elegant figure of Kamel. He's going to settle back in about fourth or fifth place. It's going to be interesting to see what the 200 metre pace is as Malaudzi comes across, followed by Lalu in second place. 25 seconds for the opening 200 metres, and sometimes that's where the damage is done. Athletes sometimes and often go too quickly in that opening 200 metres. Malaudzi, former Olympic silver medalist, decides he wants to be in the lead. Lalu of Morocco on the outside. And Bozakovsky there, coming up quickly onto the outside. And now they're pushing and shoving again. That's a bit desperate there. With Simmons definitely wanted to be there. 53 seconds for the opening 400 metres. And the, the whole field is gathered there. They're all together. Nobody's making a move. Nobody's dashing yet. And look at Bozakovsky on the outside. While Maladzi starts to make them run down the back straight. Well, Kavuna lost his shoe, the second of the Kenyans, after about 250 metres, so he's got a real disadvantage. 
Nick Simmons and Malazzi. Malazzi in the lead. Lalu in third place. Kamal in fourth. Right round the outside is Bram Song. It's anybody's world title. Malazzi, can he hang on? Nick Simmons is running a good race. He's ready to pounce, but so is Kamel, the 1500 meter champion. And Alfred Kerwayego is coming down the home straight. Malazzi's going to hang on to take the gold medal. Oh, Malazzi gets it, a photograph for second. Behind Kerwa, uh, between Kerma and Kamel. 1.45.30, that really does go against the form book. Done. He thinks Done. he's got it. Who on earth has got the silver medal? And this guy could not quite defend the title. He won in Osaka two years ago. A wide open race. Nobody could predict that one. He would have been a long shot. If he'd been to the bookies, he wouldn't have got, he would have got a long price for him. But there's the Kenyan athlete Kavuna. Unfortunately, losing one of his shoes at the crucial point in that race in the back straight on the first lap. He managed to do well to keep going all the way and getting getting amongst them. But you couldn't pick that winner. Muladzi decided that the best place for him to be was in the lead. He's having a bit of a laugh with his South African teammates as he sets off on his lap of honor. But there he is, Muladzi holding them off. On the outside, Simmons coming there. Go past the 200 meter point, Muladzi's kicking. Lalu went through on the inside. And here comes the big move from the 1500 meter champion, Kamel. His father won this race twice in the past and into the finishing straight. Well, this opportunity for him, you thought, if he was as good as we thought he is, as we think he is, he would have run away with this one. Kerr was running a long way from the back. Simmons is fading. Lalu's on the inside. Borzakovsky's finishing quickly, but Muladzi's stolen a march on them. And 145.3 is a slow finishing time for this event. 53 seconds for the first lap, and then 52 seconds for the second lap. And clearly, they were a mixture. There was no one who was outstanding. And Muladzi, to be honest with you, I think he stole this one. They were coming the straight. They're all queuing up. They're all getting ready to make the move. But as he's going faster and faster, Kerr was finishing quickly on this side. Borzakowski's finishing quickly on this side. But they all forgot to do one thing. They forgot to pass the leader. So Muladzi is the champion. A big surprise. The Commonwealth champion becomes the world champion. Kamel in second place, Yego in third, and you see it, and you see it sometimes. The athletes are battling together, they're working so hard. The athlete in the front is going as quickly as the rest of them. Nobody's gaining very much. They're all giving themselves a chance. The big tall figure of Lopez from Cuba wasn't a match for these guys today. And Maludzi is a great result. Simmons, a little disappointing. Yego nearly defended his title. Borzakowski ran a good race and Kamel too, but Muladzi beat them and stole it. Charles Rockter into the fifth round now. Six metres and 71 so far, down in sixth place. Gillian record holder, both long and triple jump. Oh, that's a foul there. Is it still Brittany Reese leading? Seven metres and ten. Fabulous jump, then Lebedeva. So, South Africa take both the women's and the men's title now. Malazi, 145.29, and after a long, distinguished international career, that goes down as his biggest win ever. And the men in second and third place given exactly the same time, so it was down to thousands of a second. Alfred Kerwiego of Kenya, 145.35, got the silver. And Yusuf Saad Kamel, the 1,500-metre champion, the bronze. So, Olga Kucherenko of Russia, 6 metres 77. For fifth place at the moment, her teammate, the defending champion, Lebedeva, in second place, trying to defend her title. She won in Osaka two years ago. Chirenko's jumped 6.91 this year. Oh, no. 
red flag as well. You can see a clear foul. Well, here is the medal ceremony for what was a tremendous men's pole vault yesterday. Renaud Lavillene of France takes the bronze medal. He's jumped six metres and one centimetre this year. Couldn't quite reproduce that yesterday. And also from France, Romain Menil. One of the best pole vaulters in the world. Hasn't always produced it when it's mattered the most. That's his second silver medal at a world level. Gold medalist and world champion representing Australia. Mit zwei Versuchen, Gewinner der Goldmedaille und Weltmeister für Australien, Stephen Hooker. Stephen Hooker was simply sensational. He was pretty much jumping on one leg, straight as the duck to coming into the championships, qualified with one jump, looked in agony, had a pain killing an injection, had just two attempts in the final, one at 590, which he cleared, and that made him the world champion. Please rise for the national anthem of Australia. Meine Damen und Herren, bitte erheben Sie sich nun für die Nationalhymne von Australien. Might be the Olympic champion, but I'm not sure that a gold medal will ever be quite as sweet as this one. Well, we're going to speak to Steve Hooker shortly, but we've got a revised 1500 meter result coming up, Crammy. Well, there is the picture of the woman who thought she won the 1500 meters, and I've just been watching her. She's received the bad news down there for her, and good, very good news for Great Britain that Jamal is now the gold medalist, Lisa Dabrisky promoted to the silver medal, 100 away from winning the World Championship final. Shannon Robry now gets the bronze medal. Rodriguez disqualified for pushing Berka with 200 metres to go, going for a gap that just was not there. There's confirmation of that. Salsuli didn't start the race. Well, as we thought, I don't think really there was uh, too much argument for Rodriguez. I've been watching her down there. I think she's accepted what happened. She knew she did wrong. But that's a silver for Lisa Dabrisky, and so close to a gold. Well, it was a truly wonderful, wonderful performance from Steve Hooker. And after that gold medal performance, he spoke to Phil. Well, Steve, that's a truly astonishing performance. I mean, coming in tonight, realistically, you thought you had maybe one, two jumps in you and to come away with the gold medal. That's amazing. Yeah, realistically, coming, in, coming here today, I thought... Um, I was going to open at 85, I knew the pole that I needed for that and I was pretty disappointed when I didn't jump it on my first attempt. I thought jumping at 85, that'd be enough for silver and I was going to be happy to walk away with that, so... Ecstatic, in fact, but for it to play out the way it did, for to, to get the result that I did, it's amazing. I can't really believe that it's happened and it won't sink in for a while, I don't think. And we can hear just from the atmosphere now, what a crowd tonight, oh. they're right behind you guys. I've never been in a stadium like this, this is amazing, I mean... When the German athletes are going around, it's sensational. But, I mean, for us as well, for the foreigners, they get behind us just as much. And I really, really appreciated the support of the crowd tonight, for sure. I know Berlin's a special place for you already from selling a personal best here. Now it's going to have a place in your heart forever and a day, isn't it? Absolutely. It's an amazing place to jump. I love jumping here. And, um, you know, it might be a good place to come in the future and try and set some super big heights. And we can't overstate, really, just what you've been through. And now, you know, you've... You came in under the radar, you're trying to you know, play it down as much as you can, but it's a, a, a true test of your character that you pulled through the way you did. Look, I was trying to be as honest as I could with everyone the whole way through the process. 
I, I wasn't sure during the week whether I'd compete. It wasn't until the day of qualifying that I made that decision. Immediately after the, the qualifying, I thought I was no chance even for the final, but I pulled up well. And my medical staff were amazing support, and they really got me through in good enough condition where I was able to take those two jumps, and that was all it took. Thanks. A magnificent performance. I can't emphasise enough how much. Congratulations. Congratulations. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Well, from a gold medalist, a silver medalist, Lisa Dabriskie now, and she'll get her medal in about 10, 15 minutes' time. What medal, if at all, will the Great Britain 4x1, 4x4 team get? The running order I've just been handed is McConnell, Uhurugu, Barr and Sanders. And that is the penultimate race on the track today, followed, obviously, by the 4x4 four four for men to round things off. Just a quick word about Dabriskie's silver. I mean, you know, a silver is a silver. But when she watches that race back, she'll be thinking, I was, I was that far from yeah. being world champion. Yeah, no, she was a fraction away from that. But, you know, she's, she's very realistic, and she'll know that what she's done is amazing in itself. So having all that in mind, I think, um, I think Lisa can go from here, head held high and proud of her achievements. Absolutely. OK, well, we've gone about 20 minutes without talking about Usain Bolt, so we must talk about him now. And this morning, the world's media turned up to see him yet again, and from all reports, it was absolute mayhem. I'm so special, I'm so special, so special, so special. That's why I'm a strap with my father five special. Boy, I pre me together and they want to chase like fatal. Thank I'm so special, I'm so special, so special, so special. Tell them no fear to fear. This was a great championship. Awesome and magnificent. <laughs> just another average day for you nowadays, isn't it? All this kind of media scrum. Yeah, yeah, just average day. Um, I'm, I'm kind of getting used to it, so it's all right. I decided that me and my coach, we decided that we need to we need to really prove this year that last year wasn't a joke. Uh, so we came out here and we just I just did my best. I worked hard. I was a little bit tired this year. But <laughs> I worked hard. I worked even harder to, to, to really um, to try to do as best to to I can explain. I've matured a lot since the Olympics, and it has definitely helped me. And I have won a gold medal, two gold medals here, and I could not have asked for anything else. I'm 22 and. I did not even know I was going to be an athlete and it happened in three years and I'm just excited. One of the great things you've done, I think, is, is you've transformed the sport in terms of the personality of people yeah. at the start line. Everybody's doing it, even the long distance yeah. races now. Yeah, I think so. I think, I think it really helps because people really like to see people just do wonderful stuff. And it's very funny. I, I was laughing most of the times when I was watching these races, see these guys doing all kind of stuff. So it's just wonderful. And I think that the sport's getting where it should be, just people having fun and people coming out and seeing people having fun. And I suppose that's part of uh, what Jamaica's all about. I hear it's been voted the third happiest place to be in the world <laughs> yeah definitely it's going to be wonderful i saw some clippings again in jamaica uh, it was wonderful and i know the people said they can't wait for me to come home so i'm really looking forward to going home it's wonderful there and all the way through you've had a great rapport with the british fans back back in the country they're giving you great support i know yeah. that and i know you love them yeah definitely i love these guys uh, when i came to london me it was it was wonderful they, they came out i think there was all jamaicans in the stands really and they came out and supported us so I'm definitely looking forward to 20, 2012 Olympics. It's going to be extremely wonderful. And the uh, city of Berlin actually gave him a special present today. Have you seen this? Uh, a segment of the original Berlin Wall, 12 feet high and weighing three tons. <laughs> <laughs> so I look forward to seeing him taking that through security on the way home tomorrow morning. Uh, this is just a very quick thing. We, we saw Shelly Ann Fraser there. Um, sprinting now seems to be basically just a duel between America and Jamaica, which is great for the Americans and great for the Jamaicans, and it's interesting perhaps to a point for the rest of the world. Does athletics need, though, other nations to start providing sprinters of that quality to, to make, the, make it a broader range of nations that are involved at that level? I, I think it helps when you have representation from all around the world. It's a global sport, one of the truly global sports from around the world, and, and I think that that helps. But, you know, it, you know, you can't mandate that. That's something that, you know, the other countries have to step up. America has to step up, I, I, honestly, because, you know, you look at the women's 100 meters, the Jamaicans took up four of the lanes, half of the track in the final. So the Americans have to step up, the Europeans have to step up. You also notice that a lot of the Caribbean countries are stepping up as well, and they're having much more representation in these finals, particularly in the sprints and hurdles. So the European countries are going to have to really step it up and, and rightfully take their place at the table. OK, well, from the sprints to the middle distances, and South Africa have won both the 800-metre titles here, and here's the men's winner.
Well, what a story yours is to win the gold medal after the kind of trials and tribulations you've been through this year. I mean, it's been such a, such a, an emotional ride for you. Yes, I mean, I've been through a lot of difficulties this year. Get sick for a man. You know, when I was recovering, get injured, you know. Come to Europe, battle with some few races. But uh, I think uh, God was on my side this year, you know. I went home back and just trained with my coach and have a good family support and then come back ready for the championship. You drew on all your reserves of energy, but more importantly, determination. You weren't going to be beaten there, it seemed. Yeah, I mean, I've tried so many times to win a big championship, you know. Uh, every time when I'm in the race, I just change my tactic, you know. But today, I, I just told myself I need to control the race, need to be able to change my own rhythm. Don't want anyone to change the rhythm first. So that's what I did. And I saw when you finished that you shouted up to somebody, I told you so. What, what did you say? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I told my uh, Piet van Sale, he's my manager in South Africa, you know, I told him uh, just after the semi-finals. Uh, uh, he said, uh, uh, anyway, you did well, you know, let's just wait for Sunday. And I said, Piet, just wait. Come Sunday and then you will see what will happen. And look what happened. You are now world champion. Congratulations. Thank you very much. Brilliant. Brilliant. You won't be well, back over in the javelin. Vasilevskis of Latvia. He's had a lot of fouls and only a best of 82.05. The only man over 90 metres this year, and that looks as though it could be an improvement. Well, this whole competition, since that absolute bomb of a throw, by Andreas Torkelsen of 89.50. has fallen a little bit flat, Jonathan. Well, he killed it with those two throws early on. 82.37 for Vasilevskis. He misses out on a medal after qualifying with over 86 metres. Guillermo Martinez now. The last person who can beat Torkelsen. Otherwise, the Norwegians won the world title. He's got hold of that one. It's flying. Oh! Over 85 metres, a season's best performance, undoubtedly. And he reinforces his stake to that silver medal. That is a real big surprise. But what it means is that Andreas Torkelsen has done the clean sweep now. Double Olympic champion, he's European champion, and for the first time, he becomes world champion. Yeah, super, super performance from Torkelsen. 89.59, then 88.95 in the third round. Just destroyed the rest of the field, and after that, they were only ever going for second, and it was Martinez who stepped up. I tell you what, I'd love to see this guy in the gym. Very, very powerful indeed. Not the tallest. Perfect stature, actually, for Olympic weightlifting. Really is. So 86-41 it was for Martinez, and a silver medal. And Murakami of Japan in third place. We've had some uh, great races already this afternoon, and uh, the men's 5,000 metres, no exception, got us underway. James Qualia, formerly of Kenya, now running for Qatar, took the bronze medal. It was a battle ahead of him, though, right to the line, just about for the gold. The defending champion, Bernard Lagat, did his very, very best. He's taken two medals from these championships, bronze in the 1500, silver now in the 5,000 metres. And he knows if you're going to lose, you want to lose to a real, true champion, one of the best ever, if not the best ever. First time he's won the World Championship title at 5,000 metres. Four times at 10,000, of course. And who could doubt not only his physical ability, but his mental fortitude as well. Really had to scrap for that one. That might rise. make it a little bit sweeter, if anything else. Ethiopia. Meine Damen und Herren, bitte erheben Sie sich nun für die Nationalhymne von Äthiopien.
Ethiopia's and Kanisha Bekele's second gold medal. It's been a good day for them, won a bronze in the marathon as well earlier on today. The medalists in the men's 800 meters. There's confirmation of that men's Japan result. Two time world champion, silver medalist, but double Olympic champion Torkinson eventually becomes the world champion, 89 59. Martinez, surprise silver medal for Cuba, 86-41, a season's best. And Murakami, an even greater surprise in the bronze medal position for Japan. So we're in now to the final few jumpers in this women's long jump competition. It's still as we were, Brittany Reese leading, Lebedeva second, Melis of Turkey in third place, Gomez fourth, and this woman, Kucherenko, in fifth place. Now good height off the board. She's got a white flag. She got a bronze medal in the European indoors earlier on this year. But this has been her best <laughs> performance in a major outdoor championship. And I think that little smile tells the story. It's one thing having a personal best of 691. It's another thing producing a decent performance when it really matters. She's done that here. 668, her final jump. Uh, Christina Hurugu is going to run the second leg for Great Britain in the women's 4 by 400 meter relay, which is the next final on the track. She comes into this final, having uh, been rested for the semi. And I tell you what, she's up against one of the most talented athletes the world has seen for 400 meters, Alison Felix for the USA. This long jump competition has never really come alive for Nadia Gomez. We saw her jump in London, she looks superb, 6 meters 89. She really has been the leading long jump in the world for the last couple of years. That'll be one nervous young lady. Karin Melis of Turkey. I don't see Turkey on the medal rostrum very much. So Gomez, final attempt. Six metres 80 she needs. And she hasn't done it. That's a big surprise. Big surprise. Well, here we start the lineups for the women's 4x4. Cuba on the inside, three times they've reached the final, but the best result they've ever had, well, they've actually done it three times, was seventh. Lee McConnell, the lead-off runner for Great Britain in lane two. Kristen Harigu on two, Vicky Barr on three, and Nicola Sanders brings the baton home. She ran superbly on the first leg in the semi-final. Nigeria could be dangerous. Very talented team. Their national record, 329.60. And then we've got three big teams all in a row. Russia, the Olympic champions. Anastasia Kapinskaya, the lead-off runner there. And Kriva Shapka, a bronze medalist in the individual event, brings the baton home. Then Debbie Dunn for the United States. Well, they brought in Alison Felix and Lashinda Demas, silver medalist in the 400-meter hurdles. And the individual champion, Sanya Richards, the last leg runner. There she is. Super talented team. Jamaica, Rosemary White, who finished seventh in the Olympic final. She's the leadoff runner for them. Surely they're going to be in amongst the medals. They got silver two years ago in Osaka. France have done well to reach this final. Virginie Michenol leads off for them. And their best 400 meter, Solène Desert Marilaire, brings the baton home. And listen to this for the host nation. They got a medal in the 4x100 meters yesterday. Can they get on the rostrum once again? So we have gold, silver, and bronze from two years ago. Christina Hurugu and Alison Felix. Christine on the left, Alison just hiding behind the Nigerian on the right. I'm dying to watch her run a 400 metres. But Lee McConnell has the responsibility of taking this away for Great Britain. Bronze medal two years ago. Can they get on the rostrum once more? It's going to be very, very tough indeed, and a lot will depend on the considerable talent of Christina Hurugu. Set. 
Away they go first time. The Jamaicans didn't get away too well. But at the moment, Rosemary White well into her running. And the Americans are closing them down. Now, what about Lee McConnell? Not really made up any ground yet on Nigeria outside them. And the Russians have gone off very quickly indeed, Steve. They have, and I think the important thing is for Lee McConnell not to panic because it was always expected that in those two lanes there, Russia and the USA, very strong, would go away. And look at the big gap there. Germany are on the outside, they're going to be a threat to us, and so are Jamaica. And Lee's got to get Christine in the race, give her an opportunity. We've got a good home straight here, and uh, then they stagger will in one and wind up with the next bend. Obviously, USA right out there. Russia just starting to tire a little bit, but we've got to give Christine a chance to be right in amongst it here. We're going to be about fourth or fifth. Felix takes the baton for the USA. Ahurugu is away safely. And certainly, USA in the lead. Russia in second. Jamaica in third. And Christian Ahurugu, I think, by the time everybody breaks onto the inside lane, is going to be in fourth place, but about 25 metres behind the leader. Alison Felix is absolutely flying here for the United States. Very tight for second. And Christian Ahurugu is actually being caught in fourth place. Well, the selection, uh, they would have wanted to know what the other teams were doing, and uh, we gambled with this. I'm not sure the gamble is uh, going to pay off. There's a long way to go here. Christina Horigu trying to make up some ground. And, of course, Jamaica are a strong team. The Russians uh, will try and get close to the Americans. They won't because of Alison Felix's leg there. So, Vicky Barr with oh, 15, 20 metres. It wasn't a good change. We lost another two, three metres. And she's got a tough job on her hands here. She's got to try and chain, chase Sharifa Lloyd, but she's the weak the weakest of the Jamaican team, so maybe she's got an opportunity, but they're a long way ahead. Well, that is Lashinda Dimas, of course, who got a silver medal in the 400-metre hurdles. And the Germans challenging just behind Nigeria and France. Vicky Barr is very safe at the moment in fourth place. The rest are away and flying. The United States coming into the home straight, getting ready for the last changeover. Russia just in second. Jamaica in third and Vicky Barr safe in fourth. But here come the USA, all of the outgoing athletes lined up. Now, what about the changeover? Sanya Richards, the individual 400-metre champion, is away and running. Nicola Sanders has absolutely no chance of catching that gap. She's in no-man's land there. And there's a real scrap on for second place. Jamaica have run a brilliant race here. I thought the Russians would be clear in second and we'd be fighting with the Jamaicans, but not the case. Sanya Richards cruising. Jamaica have now moved into second place, Russia third, and they're a long, long way ahead of Nicola Sanders, who will hold on to four. Well, Sherika Williams is going brilliantly for Jamaica. She's up against Kriva Shapka, but here come the champions-elect. They've won it so many times before, and Sanya Richards... Absolutely going down the home straight, really going for gold now. Sanya Richards wins her second gold medal, United States get gold, brilliant silver medal for Jamaica, Russia get third, and Nicola Sanders, uh, she, she did gain ground, Great Britain finishing in fourth place, then Germany, Nigeria, France, and finally Cuba. Well... Great Britain got stranded in that fourth position quite early and there was no way back. The winning time, though, very quick indeed. Just over three minutes, 17 seconds. That's only a couple of seconds away from the world record and just a, a fraction of a second outside the championship record, too. Well, as we look at the Americans, I can give you the times for the British quartet. 52-1 for Lee McConnell on the first leg. That's the, uh, the hard leg. Don't expect the fast time on there. But Nicholas Sanders yesterday did 50.9 on that leg. And we weren't in the race, really. Christina Horigu ran 50.6, but then had a poor change to Vicky Barr, who ran 52 seconds exactly slower than she did yesterday. And then Sanders, 50.4. No doubt about the winners. Well clear. It was always going to be the USA to win it. Jamaica ran brilliantly, I thought, for second, but we were slower, I think, than we were yesterday in qualification. Disappointing, fourth place, the worst place to finish. Well, Michael, this changeover looked at a little bit of a mess-up as far as Great Britain are concerned. Vicky Barr is out in lane, well, seventh from the, the right-hand side as we look at it. 
Yeah, we'll take a look at it now. What they do is they line you up according to how the teams are coming in with 100 meters to go, and you can't change after that. At this point, I don't think that the U uh, the British team would have been all the way out in the back, and, and this would have had to have them at seventh or eighth place. Now, Christine has to come all the way over across the track. Vicky doesn't get out because she probably is confused as to what's going on there at that point, so it did cost them at least a couple of hundredths of a second there. Vicky Barr was the weak leg. Nicholas Sanders having to now try to make up as much ground as possible, but it was over when she got the baton. This, this particular strategy, I, I question whether it was the best uh, lineup for the team. So USA winning that comfortably, 3.17.83, the fastest time in the world this year. Jamaica, 3.21.15, and Russia get the bronze medal with Great Britain in fourth place, and they're down with Phil now. Well, there's a little bit of bewilderment down here, I think, Lee, to exactly what happened on that, that change-up. Having watched it, you've been robbed, certainly, of um, a couple of tenths, maybe 20 metres or so. Yeah, I don't know what happened. Um, we were obviously lined up in the wrong position. Not, not our fault. We were put in that position. Uh, I think Vicky argued the point that we shouldn't have been in that position, but it's obviously lost a bit of time, and Christine had to dive over to try and pass it to Vic. So it's been this ability change over. It's, it's a shame. And for Christine, you, as you're coming in there, you're expecting to see her right in your eye line. I could see Vicky waving furiously, and you weren't expecting her to be there on the outside. No, I was, um, as you were running, you're pretty much just concentrating on trying to finish the run. So um, I really had to kind of look up and see her in front, but I couldn't find her, and I panicked, and I, then I saw her waving, and I thought I, then it, was, it was a bit annoying having to kind of stop my stride and then cut out and then... What was happening to you? What were the officials doing to you there, Vicky? Well, I counted, because obviously he counted 200, and I saw Chrissy was in fourth. So I lined up in fourth, and then the next thing I knew, the official was over, putting everyone else in front of me. So I tried to push to get into the right place, but it's too tightly packed. And Chrissy was coming down, so the best I could do was just wave. But it's really disappointing, because that took a big chunk out of how close we were to Jamaica. Nicola, a fine last leg from you, and in the end, though, it was, a, it was a lost cause. Yeah, I mean, I didn't really see what happened. All I saw was Vicky waving furiously, and obviously I was focusing on getting it off her, so I didn't really know what was going on, but by the time I got the baton, we were in no-man's land, so, I mean, I tried to chase down as best I could, but they had a good few metres on me. Well, fourth place and the season's best. I know it didn't go ideally for you, but we thank you for explaining it. Thanks a lot. Well, the British time just outside the all-time top ten, but let, let me give you the splits for the American team. This is why they became world champions. Debbie Dunn, the lead-off runner, sixth in the individual final, 50.3. Alison Felix, the 200-metre champion, 48.9. Lucinda Demas, who was supposed to be the weak link in the side, 50 seconds dead, and then Sonia Richards brought the baton home, 48.6. Phenomenal. Well, there's no change in the last few jumps in the women's long jump. Brittany Reese of the USA takes it seven metres and ten. Of course, Dwight Phillips took the men's long jump as well. So, double goal there for the Americans. Leber David, the defending champion, just fell short. 697 seasons best in second place. And a surprise bronze for Turkey and Karen May Mellis, six metres and eighty. And so we have just one more race to go. The men's four by four. We've won this twice. Can we get some kind of a medal to round off what's been a pretty successful championships for Great Britain generally, of which more later. And we'll talk about the Great Britain women relay team in that last race in a moment, but that American quartet were awesome, weren't they? They were. It's one of the best teams they've ever put together. I mean, and they brought two individuals from other events up to the 400, and Alice and Felix, who competed and obviously won the 200 metres here, world champion in the 200 metres, and then Lashinda Demas, who was a silver medalist in the 400 metre hurdles. So, you know, they've got so much talent, the U.S., at the 400 metres that you can bring to two of your best 400 metre runners don't run the individual 400. Do you think, actually, that the nature of the strength and depth in some events means that even though these are the world championships, there should be a USA 1 and a USA 2 able to compete in these kind of things? No, or not no, no, because again, as we talked about you know, earlier about this needing to be more global, I, I almost think that, you know, looking back to the 4 by ones uh, that we shouldn't have prelims. Just put all of the, the, the top eight best teams in there so you have a true representation of the best eight 
teams in the, in the world competing in each relay. So what you could do is you could almost seed it and have some teams get a buy into the final, and you could have qualification races for the second tier of nations. Maybe. Yeah, you could do that because you already have, at this point, the teams that do get here are the teams that have qualified. You do have to qualify to be here, then they cut it off at a certain number of, of, of teams that actually qualify and that can come here to compete. Okay, you, uh, you made the point when we were looked in the immediate aftermath of the race that you weren't happy about the British tactics and maybe also about the personnel. What would you have done differently? I, I probably wouldn't have put in, 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 Colin just suggested this earlier that, you know, Lee McConnell on the first leg probably wasn't the best. You want to get out and get out there a little bit quicker and faster. You know, if you're going to, if you're going to do something on ortho, orthodox, go all the way. Put Christina Hurugu or Nicola Sanders on the first leg. Get out there, give your athletes, give your team a lead. I would have put Barr on the second leg, on the weak leg, and then I would have come back and, and kept Nicola Sanders or um, uh, Christina Hurugu on the ankle. But, you know, this thing, I don't think it was going to make a difference, really. I mean, they were just outclassed with the top three, and, uh, and even with the, the exchange little mess up there, it wasn't going to make a difference at the end of the day. Those top three were just too strong. And the key thing as well, though, is that if you're not in the race early on, it's very, very hard to make up ground like that as the race progresses. Oh, it's a, it's a tough thing to do because everybody has a sense of fatigue as well, so you've got to add that into the equation too. So perhaps for me, I would have just swap the first two runners around. We let Christine set the team off, give them a bit of confidence so that they can actually get on and, and be part of the race. OK, so we have five British medalists in these championships so far, and uh, we are hoping to hear about Lisa Dabriskie's medal ceremony in just a moment or so, brief hesitation there, but that's not going to happen for a couple of moments' time. So it all began, obviously, with Jessica Ennis getting her gold medal last weekend. So what do you do? You know, you've got your gold medal around your neck and you hang around in Berlin for four or five days. What do you do? You do this. I've had such a great time here and obviously it's my first gold medal, so yeah, I'll never forget it. I love the way she bites her lip. I love the way she shakes them hips. I love the way she makes me drool. I think that she is beautiful. My world's kind of being turned upside down. It's just, it's brilliant. She's so lovely. She's so lovely. She's so lovely. The occasion the reaction from home of people saying to you, you know, you're, you're on the front page of the papers and there's been, yeah. you know, all kinds of reaction to you back home. Yeah, I've obviously spoke to my parents a lot and friends and my mum's got all the papers and everything but it's kind of hard to to realize what it's like at home um so you're kind of in a bit of a bubble here so although i know what's going on it still hasn't really sunk in how how big it's been and so what would be do you think the, the one overriding memory of the of the whole week and that is it is it getting the medal itself is it the moment you clinch victory i think definitely being up on the podium and getting the medal it was it was just such a great feeling and being in the stadium and where the podium is right on the top of the, the stadium and looking out was just really, really exciting and, and emotional as well. Is it one of those goosebump moments? Yeah, definitely. It was, I was kind of, I could feel tears coming in my eyes, but I just, I fought them and held them back and just really enjoyed the moment. Team's doing so well and obviously Philip's winning a gold medal and Jenny, was, amazing to watch and yeah I hope that I did set the tone and and inspired a few people on the team and I think we've got you know a lot more medals to come. <laughs> Shopping! <laughs> and I really want to just enjoy this moment and, and make the most of it but also it's, it's really important for me to know that although all these great things are happening you know this is you know, it's not the end of my career this is kind of the start and you know, there's a lot more that I want to achieve with 2012 and it's important that I do get back into training and concentrate on that element because essentially, you know, if I neglect training and, and stuff like that, then my performance will drop and, and everything will change that way. So for me, I just want to enjoy this moment, get back into training and then just start preparing for the next big championship. And you can see Jessica Ennis and all the other British medalists from here in Berlin at Gateshead. The British Grand Prix starts at 2 o'clock and it's on BBC Two on Monday week. So that's a back on Monday. Tonight on BBC Two, Match of the Day 2 features the Fulham Chelsea game from today and also all the highlights from the weekend with Man U and Arsenal scoring loads of goals. That's tonight at 10.15. And then next weekend, 
bumper sport on both BBC One and BBC Two. The Rugby League Challenge Cup final, Huddersfield and Warrington from Wembley. And then on BBC Two from 9 o'clock next morning on the red button, the Rowing World Championships from Poznan in Poland. And it's also on BBC Two uh, from sort of lunchtime onwards as well. Colin, if you were Jessica Ennis's management team, you'd be eyeing rich pickings over the next couple of years or so, wouldn't you? Yeah, you definitely think Jessica's going to be the, friends, the face of 2012. Um, she's a good-looking girl, she's very talented, so if you add all those things into the equation, then she's very marketable indeed. OK, one race to go, it's the usual finale, and let's hope it's as dramatic as it has been on so many occasions in the past. Steve Grant. Thank you, John. One more time. And one more time, hopefully, for the British 4x4 squad. They've won this title on two occasions, famously in 1991, and then, of course, with their doping violation, uh, changes to the result in 97. We're now the champions from 97 as well. So what can we do here? Nigeria, Australia, France, United States, Belgium, Dominican Republic, Great Britain and Northern Ireland, and then Poland. Chances have been enhanced by the disqualification overnight of the Bahamian 4x4 squad. After looking at the results from last night, it was judged that they had passed the baton outside of the um, of the sector. So the very last event of what's been a stunning, from my point of view, World Championships here in Berlin. I really have think, do think it's been one of the best. So our very, very final track event, Nigeria on the inside. The British team definitely have. A very, very good chance of a medal here because of that disqualification of Bahamas. Australia will think they've got a chance as well. I probably think there's five or six teams are looking at medals here. America are, are brilliant. They'll be uh, the winners, undoubtedly, unless they do something horribly wrong. But Australia, with Stephenson leading them off, Sean Rose strong on the last leg as well. The French have got a pretty good squad. I think their first two legs have been designed to put them very much in the race with Leslie Jean and Teddy Vanell to lead them off. Nobody, I think, is going to touch the American team. Angelo Taylor, Olympic champion. Jeremy Warner is an Olympic champion. And guess what? They've got a couple of other Olympic champions to finish up with. We've got three... or oh, two 400-metre hurdlers, two flat 400-metre runners in their team. I guess we should question as to whether they might fancy going uh, towards a world record held by, their, by them, of course, 254-29. Now, Belgium are a bit of a surprise package in the sense that uh, they've got some very good runners. Borle ran brilliantly yesterday on the last leg. He's been moved to the second leg. The Dominican Republic can be very dangerous as well because their anchor man is Felix Sanchez, who's had a really good world championships and finding some of his old form, the former Olympic champion over 400 meter hurdles. And then the British quartet, led off by Conrad Williams. He'll hand to Michael Bingham in mid into the final here. And then Rob Tobin on the third leg. Martin Rooney, who ran a leg in Beijing, which took the breath away, really. 43-73. And he might need to find something special here if he is to win a medal for Great Britain. Poland, always strong, have denied us on one or two occasions in the past. So get in the race, give your man on the last leg a chance. And Martin Rooney has shown in the past that if he has an opportunity on the last leg, he can run very, very quick indeed. Hasn't had the best of years individually. This will be an opportunity for him to put some of those ills right. Rob Tobin as well. Looked a little bit shaky yesterday in qualification, did Rob Tobin. Will want to run a better judge race in the final today. So Nigeria are on the inside, Australia in two, France are in three, the favourites, defending champions, United States in four, then Belgium, Dominican Republic, Great Britain in seven, Poland in lane eight. The final event of these World Championships, the men's 4 by 400 oh. reader relay. Really important that Conrad Williams just concentrates there, he's going to find, I think, that he can uh, take some... Yards out of Marcinician of Poland outside him, and he's doing that. Got to really be very much up with the other teams. Forget about America, 
they're going to run away with this, you'd imagine, although Angela Taylor hasn't gone off uh, particularly quickly. And Conrad Williams looks as though he's on a very good first leg. Now, let's hope he's judged this well into the home straight and can hold the advantage which he's gained, certainly over Poland. Australia seem to have started pretty well, and Dominican Republic have taken a few yards out of Great Britain. But Conrad Williams is running strong through to the finish here. He certainly is. He's run a very good first leg. As far as Great Britain are concerned, on to Michael Bingham. The best of the quartet in terms of the individual event, but on the second leg for the United States is Jeremy Warner, twice a world champion and silver medalist here. Dominican Republic actually coming through, and so are Australia. So Michael Bingham at the moment for Great Britain, and he's being challenged by Poland, but Bingham sees and reacts much better by Michael Bingham and going past the Dominican Republic into second place. Well, Warren has just kicked in there. It wasn't a good leg, I didn't think, from Taylor, but a good second leg from Michael Bingham. He's having to come wide to find Rob Tobin because of the position he held at the 200-metre mark. Tobin sets off in second place. Australia in third, Belgium in fourth. A bit of a shove there for Poland in the back from Dominican Republic and France right at the back of the field, but Rob Tobin, he's there to be shot at, so he's not going to panic here, he's just got to run a good race and be strong in the home straight, and we've got Rooney on the last leg. Well, look at Kieran Clement go, but Australia going past Rob Tobin. Let's hope he doesn't have a repeat of what happened in the semi-final yesterday. Let's hope Rob Tobin has left something for the finish. It's Poland behind Rob Tobin, and those four seem to have got away, but here comes Rob Tobin. The United States are away and clear, but Rob Tobin certainly has left something for the last changeover. Here goes LaShawn Merritt for the USA. Here goes Martin Rooney now in silver medal position. Good leg from Rob Tobin, much better judge race from him. Now, Rooney, he's in a medal position, he's in the silver medal position. If you'd said that to him beforehand, he would have said thank you very much. He's going to come under pressure from Sean Rowe. These two race each other fairly regularly. And Rooney, the fact that he had a three, four metre lead, he's let Rowe come to him. He will have been saving something for the finish. He'll be expecting Rowe to attack him off that top bend. United States clear underway. The gold medal is theirs. They will be the world champions, but who will come second? Martin Rooney kicking away. Rowe trying to get there. Now Rooney's got to be strong here. Right the way through the line. Takes a look over his shoulder. It's going to be gold for America. Silver for Great Britain. Australia take the bronze, and they're delighted with that. An excellent performance by the British quartet. Well done, lads. Conrad Williams, I thought, ran an excellent first leg. Bingham was good after that. Tobin was strong in the home straight and gave Rooney the opportunity to bring it home. And even without the Bahamas, they took a silver medal. It wouldn't have mattered either way. You have to get to the final. We did that. You then execute your race the best you can, and they did that as well. I thought that was a very, very good team performance. America were out there, Paul, no doubt about that, but what about that British quartet? Oh, superb, Steve. And the, the Americans, well, the time that they ran, effectively the, the fourth fastest in history, only the United States has ever run faster. I'll give you the splits of the British team. It was a great send-off by Conrad Williams, 45.5, then Michael Bingham. 44.6, good solid run, and that really put Great Britain in contention. Rob Tobin, far better than yesterday, 45.5, and Martin really brought them home, 44.9. Well, certainly we'll be talking to the British quartet very shortly. Great run by the Americans, Michael, though. Uh, definitely a good run by the Americans and uh, led off by Angelo Taylor, who didn't really get a, a, a very good first leg. As you see here, just as he's about to hand off to Jeremy Warner, Bingham and, and Warner both touch off at the exact same time. So a very good leg by Conrad Williams on the first leg for the Americans. Bingham in a little bit of a, a mess here and finds himself out of it, kicks it in, uses that speed to get himself out of trouble. He ran a great leg, 44 seconds. Wanted to make up. He was extremely disappointed after the 400. Checking himself there. But here he really opens the race up for the Great Britons. Put everybody in great position after this for Tobin and Rooney to put themselves in position for a silver medal. Bingham does it for them. They come under a little bit of pressure from the Australians, which is exciting to see. But both of those guys, Tobin and Rooney, would not be denied the silver today. 
Tobin didn't have a great race yesterday, but made up for it today. Certainly, here LaShawn Merritt, the Olymp uh, Olympic gold medalist and world champion, running away just as we saw with the women. But here, it looked like it was going to get to be a little bit interesting at first, but you can see the relaxation on Martin Rooney's face as they came off the curb and coming under attack from Sean Rowe. And he knew he had it all the way and just needed to maintain form down the home stretch, and the silver would be his. I'm sure the Australians aren't disappointed at all with the bronze medal. Rooney again saved a little bit for the end. It was smart running, let Sean Rowe kind of come back to him on the back stretch, but saved it for the end when he would need it, taking the U.S. out of it, not concerned with them, just concerned with only the Australians, knowing that he'd get a medal one way or the other. But going for the silver, showing the excitement right here. Silver medal, well done by the Americans and the British team. Well, signs of jubilation, and what a way to finish off what's been a very successful World Championships for the British team. We've got two silver medals today Lisa Debriski in the 1500 and the men's 4x4. Just to give you the American splits, 45-2 for Taylor on the first one. Jeremy Warren at 43.7. Karen Clement, 44.7. LaShawn Merritt, 44.3. All added up to 257.86. They take the gold. Great Britain, season's best in silver medal position. Australia, great performance from them. They take the bronze. Steve made the point in the commentary there that it's been a, perhaps a better than expected championships for Great Britain. The target was five medals and 14 top 18, top eight finishes. We've got six medals and 20 top eight finishes. So, all in all, a very positive step when we're working towards 2012. I think the athletics team generally will be very pleased with their performance. They're all quite a, a young team, so they're kind of building and developing together, which is great to see. And you think about 2012, it's only now, as I say, less than three years away. So I'm excited to see what this team can produce. They've got a nice building block. They've got the European Championships ahead for next year. Then, of course, another World Championships before the real test, where the British people will be there to support them to the max. Here is the final medals table, which has perhaps inevitably the USA on top. Jamaica in second, Kenya third because of their dominance in the distance events. But Great Britain finished in eighth with two of each. And in fact, 19 countries won gold medals. 36 countries in all won medals of one denomination or another. Michael, if you were assessing the strength, overall strength of Great Britain's team, what are the areas that make you more encouraged and what are the areas that you still think need a lot of work on? I think the most encouraging thing is the top eight finishes. I mean, that's a dramatic improvement over the last several championships, a dramatic improvement even over last year. And then the area of concern would be, I mean, and that's encouraging. That's something to really build off of. I mean, that, that's, that's, that's very impressive. I would, the area of concern would be not what happened at these championships, but what happens from here. You have to keep the foot down. You have to make sure you continue to put the pressure on. Don't be content, you know, and that's what I think we've seen a lot in the past where I can remember a few years ago Commonwealth Games in, in Melbourne where we saw some great performances after a disappointing Olympics in, in Athens and we saw some young talent coming through that was something to be built off of and then it was a disappointment and, and the, the foot wasn't kept down on the pedal and I think that that's what has, that would be the main concern moving forward. Well, certainly, I don't think there'll be any complacency from the likes of when you looked at Martin Rooney's face as he crossed the line, you could tell what it meant to him. And he's obviously had a, a disappointing year with injuries and everything else. And uh, a lot of people have said as well that, you know, he might be the next big thing as far as Britain's 400 metre runners and running is concerned. And he hasn't quite made the breakthrough yet, but maybe this is the catalyst for that to happen. And we have to say as well, Michael Bingham ran the most fantastic second leg there in there. He was incredible, but I think, you know, before we get to Bingham, you have to give Conrad Williams credit because he was the weak leg and touched off even with the Americans. And so I'm sure that when the, the, the team coaches put this team together, they thought, well, we'll put Bingham on second because we'll be in a little bit of a deficit after the first leg, and they weren't because of the great leg by Conrad Williams. So you have to give him credit as well. We saw Tobin interviewed after his qualification race yesterday when, by his own admission, he ran a poor, he ran a poor leg. And I'm sure, well, I'm saying I'm sure, there may have been debate about whether he would actually maintain his place in the final today, but they, they, they showed their confidence in him. And that was a, a big 
gutsy run from him as well, Colin. Oh, no, no doubt about that. And it's really, it shows you about this event, of 400 meter running. If you make a wrong decision, you push yourself out a little bit too hard in the first 200 meters, it can really cause a massive burnout effect. And that's literally what happened to Rob Tobin yesterday. But you know what? He paced his judgment was much better this today and it's uh, it's really pleased to see these guys going around on their on their lap around we have a great heritage in this distance in this race so uh, for me hopefully they can build from strength to strength i wish they'd have gone under three minutes so it'd be nice for them to be under that three minute club but Pat, michael what do you reckon one day do you think we've been pushed you guys no oh i mean <laughs> it's, it's, it's just it's so question, deep at the a, 400 and it was a very a very simple answer i'm hoping that these guys are going to get to Phil Jones before we have to go off air in three or four minutes' time. But before that, uh, Steve Cram, just a quick word. How would you assess the British team's performance overall? I think it has been very encouraging. I think um, Michael picked up on the point on them. Um, good top eight finishes as well as the medals. I think six medals would have been something that uh, UK Athletics would be uh, delighted with, to be honest, if you'd said that before we came here. Our big favourites delivered, Philip Sudowu and Jess Ennis. Uh, we picked up perhaps a surprise medal with Jenny Meadows in the 800, although maybe that's been coming. Uh, it was good to see, of course, Lisa today do what she didn't quite do last year. And the relays, we've always got a, an opportunity. So I thought I think it was uh, pretty good. And um, while I'm talking here, you probably don't want to hear from me so much. Uh, the boys have just uh, won one of those medals and now with Phil. Thanks, thanks very much, Steve. Yeah, here they are. Conrad, what a fantastic start you gave the team. You were right up there with the Americans. Yeah, I know. I mean, like yesterday, I was just up for it. Being out in lane eight yesterday, lane seven today, I was just glad to be out there. The crowd is tremendous. Everything is great. I'm thinking about Theo at home, thinking about Sam. So it's all a good emotional day for me, so I'm happy. A silver medal for you. Congratulations, Michael. What a fantastic second leg as well by you. It's really tremendous. All uh, right. Uh, even after the three rounds that I ran, I was, these guys gave me such an uplift. Now it's ready to roll today. <laughs> and Rob, you said you wanted to learn from the mistake yesterday. You did a perfect leg. Yeah, I mean, I didn't want to go out too quick, so I went off relaxed, stayed calm, and I knew I was going to come home strong and get him done home straight, which I did, and set up really in a good position. And Martin, I saw the joy as you crossed the line, the realisation you've got that silver medal. Yeah, it's my first senior medal, like at any level, but like I've done world juniors and stuff, but oh, it's about time. It's about time we got a relay medal. We've had solid teams. And always come fourth or sixth, whatever. So to come second, these boys did all the work. All I had to do is finish it off. It was lovely. Big breakthrough. Well done. Final word with you after uh, you've had a great championships. And so to, to round it off like this for the team as a whole, six medals better than expected as well. Uh, I think as long as we keep the attitude, keep away from the medal count, and keep, keep a positive, competitive spirit, we'll be at top every year. Congratulations to all of you. Well done. A great yeah. way to finish. Thanks. Absolutely good to finish with a lot of smiling British faces. So, as final thoughts, Colin, overall, a good championship. Overall, a tremendous championship, both internationally and domestically. I think everybody's done really well indeed. Okay. Uh, great championship. I think that uh, this is a great stepping stone for athletics as well. Of course, it's been down in the dumps a little bit with all of the doping scandals. So far, we've had none from this championship, and that's a great step in the right direction. And, you know, it's, it's a competitive, certainly from a British point of view, it's a competitive sporting market out there with, uh, you know, the Ashes have been going on this weekend. Uh, I think uh, England are just on the cusp of beating Australia. Uh, the Premiership football season's, you know, well, well underway. You know, athletics has to fight for its place in the sporting landscape and a, an event like this with so many individuals especially bolt if one's honest suddenly elevates the sport into a different area it's more yeah, it does i mean you know with with usain bolt uh and, and all of the great performances and that the jamaicans have even you know garnered so much interest in the sport you see so many people in this stadium you know with jamaican flags that aren't jamaican and have no connection to jamaican they just are proud to be you know they supporters of the jamaican team just like you would support you know a formula one team even so you know those kind of things can bring interest into the sport that wouldn't ordinarily be there and i think that the sport just has to be very very careful in how that's managed in all honesty when you're talking about the item they just need to manage it what, what is the one possible downside then? If you, by saying that, that they have to be careful how they manage it, how could they do it wrongly? Well, I think, first of all, they have to manage it because they, they, if you look at the history of the IAAF, they, they will sit back and say, hey, we've got Usain Bolt, that's great, and let's just ride that case though. You have to manage it and work with him, help him to, you know, say the right things, present the sport in the right way. You know, how do you build things around him and this new excitement and interest in the Jamaicans and a lot of the Caribbean teams? 
you, know, you have to do that. But also, I would work with him again, you know, just like we talked about if I were his management. You know, I would work with him and say, hey, you know, what are your what are your plans for the next four years and how can we help you and how to because he's effectively become bigger than the sport so they need he's a partner in the sport basically they need to talk with him and if if, if collectively they decided next year we're going to take a little step back it'd be great for both and it'll be great for the sport because there's some more competitiveness now in the 100 and 200 meters and you still have both coming in every now and then I, I wonder how many young kids who haven't really been interested in track and field in the past have suddenly thought I might fancy that, you know, 100, 200 metres, whatever. Well, that's what we'd hope. You know, this is the effect of these timed championships. We hope that the youngsters really will really embrace it and want to be a athlete at the highest level indeed, you know, and that's what we can only hope for. So, fingers crossed that it's managed to do that. Absolutely. Thank you very much, guys. It's, it's been fun, as they say. And uh, I think the great thing about it, it's kind of a typically British thing to say, but one of the great things about these championships have been the weather. We've had eight and a half days of the most fantastic, glorious sunshine, apart from Friday night's monsoon. But I suppose, above all else, what the last nine days have shown is that the world was ready once again to go nuts about Bolt. Bye-bye.